Hello. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, it's a. We have a spectacular guest today, and there is a lot to learn from him. You know, getting such an experienced person, and when even when you see one of his picture, also you will be able to understand whom you are talking to. When you call masters, these are the real masters. So, hear me a little more. yeah uh, like he uh, as as you said he is somebody who uh, follow along and uh, respect a lot in whatever in photography and that's jeffrey wu a canadian professional wildlife photographer and nature photographer and he has been accredited by professional photographers of canada he is an artist author educator and a conservationist and currently uh, like very recently he has become the kenya tourism board brand partner and he have judged lot of uh, international uh, most pre prestigious competitions uh, including 2018 2019 nikon photo contest 2017 2019 nature's best photography africa and he has been assigned a, a lot of work uh, by nikon china so let's Welcome, Jeffrey Wu. Today, hello. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nisha. Hi, Ames. Hi, hi, hi. Thank hi. you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So, I mean, it it was an uh, you know, I was actually a bit worried to talk to you. I'm, I was not sure whether you will say yes or no, but you know, when you said yes, I was very so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, i i was really i must say that i'm really privileged to meet jeffrey in person and spoke to him and i've seen him in action so i'm so happy to sh you know share the space with him over here with all of you so let's i'm yeah, just happy to anybody to anybody who visit masemara might have crossed his vehicle one or the other time <laughs> Uh, yes, because uh, I am I meet Masamara every year about uh, anywhere from eight months to ten months. Uh, for instance, uh, since pandemic, uh, I was about the last one to leave Kenya uh, last year in March. Uh, March twenty fourth, I left Kenya. The lockdown on March twenty fifth, and August first when Kenya reopened, I'm the I was in the first flight from Lufthansa to Kenya, <laughs> and uh, it is my privilege um, actually uh, to be here. Um, thank you, Nisha, for invite me, and also the uh, um, uh, it's such a pleasant that we we spend a uh, few months together. I think in Nisha on and off in Mara um, from last year. <laughs> I think from. Uh, September, October, all all the way to this year January. So I, I always uh, see Nisha on the field. So we we, we are very good friend too. Um, and uh, yes, um, I, I'm right now. I'm still in Kenya. Uh, this is a small cottage. My friend, my friend's cottage in Nairobi. Okay. Um, Kenya. Um, um, just left another lockdown. Um, so I'm. Going back to Mara in two days to doing a documentary. So okay. anyway, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, um, presentation. And uh, as you know, teaching is one of my uh, passion uh, to share and uh, to share my knowledge and uh, yeah. and uh, tricks, techniques in wildlife photography. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's let's. Uh... Get into a, br a brief introduction about yourself, if you want to, like, uh, say more than what I have uh, spoke about you. And uh, okay. we'll go to I the presentation. Think presentation. The first two minutes, basically, is uh, um, because your your viewer probably is different from my regular viewer. So yes, the first two minutes of a presentation basically is to everybody who I am. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we we'll just go to the presentation and. Um, Uh, yeah, because sure. the, uh, I have to let everybody know because the uh, uh, internet problem here, and uh, um, we cannot share two screen at the same time. So when everybody is seeing the presentation, you only see 
the PowerPoint presentation, you will not see me because I have to run back and forth to adjust the uh, route and etc. Yeah. So, um, so let's start. This this, uh, this presentation will be long. <laughs> I'm expecting for 90 minutes to two hour and uh, plus Q and A. Uh, we probably gonna be sitting here for about two hours, uh, two three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah happy to sit. <laughs> Let me just share the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can black me off. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, today we are gonna talk about, um, this is a, a lecture about introduction to wildlife photography. Um, um, so it's- okay. uh, Can we make it will, a full screen? We will uh, cover uh, kind of uh, broader uh, topics. Um, uh, but it is just that uh, introduction. Um, I do um, photographic teaching for past a few years as well. Basically, my main um, focus is the uh, pro photographers. So, but so this is uh, like entry level wildlife photography. So we talk about what is wildlife photography, what is a good wildlife photography uh, work. So and. Uh, and let's just spend like a couple of minutes to to um, to talk about who is Jeffrey Wu. So I'm a Canadian a professional wildlife photographer. I was born and raised in China. Um, and after in 1993, I immigrated to Canada. So right now I'm a Canadian wildlife photographer. I... Uh, um, I probably spent half of my life in China and half of my life in Canada. So I, I'm, um, I, uh, as you can see, I can use this uh, Professional Photographers of Canada logo on my website because I was accredited by this organization, uh, Professional Photographers of Canada. Um, accreditation uh, at the beginning actually in I think in 2000, that was 2009 or 2010, it brought me some amount of the uh, professional work. Uh, but so therefore, I can actually use this uh, logo in on my website. But my main market is uh, China because of bilingual uh, uh, advantages. So. I'm probably considered one of the uh, most influential wildlife photographers of China. Uh, if you go to Baidu.com, which in China, you, as we know, we don't have Google, so the biggest online search engine of China, um, my portfolio has to be viewed more than 3 million times. And the Chinese national TV did a documentary on 2017, and also I have a... Uh, I have a... Uh, uh, the, uh, um, I think the, um, another one is the uh, uh, motivational speech, the road less traveled in China uh, in multiple video mu uh, viewing platforms already more than uh, 6 million times. And also I am a um, certified judge for Canadian Association for Photographic Art, uh, CAPA. I've been judged more than 50 uh, international, national, and domestic photographic competitions, including 2015, um, 2017 Toronto International Photographic Festival. And in 2016, uh, um, I become judge of Nature's Best uh, Photography Africa, um, which won, uh, as people know, one of the most prestigious uh, photographic competition. And uh, um, in 2018, 2019, I judged uh, Nikon photo contests. Uh, I think the, I, that was 120,000 images uh, that we, we judged in Tokyo for uh, gruesome six days. Sorry. 
sex days uh, um, uh jeff jeff uh, are you yeah. uh, changing the slides in between what are you changing the slides in between because we can see the first slide um sorry right now i am in slide you you only see the first slide yeah till now we were seeing the first slide so i think you can make the full screen and no see. that that is not working how about now no uh oh, okay in the bottom there is an option to make it full screen yeah now it is working but it is not full screen okay what about sorry bottom full screen over here no 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 not that uh which one from the left you will get you can see a slider the plus minus uh, on the bottom right uh, this one here yeah before minus there is a icon you can click on that sorry i'm very sorry no problem okay let me see on the bottom right third after, after you can see notes comments and after comments 1 2 3 fourth one 1 2 3 4 1 you mean the uh, uh, plus or minus one no Next before slide. plus before plus or minus okay right now it says sorry Okay. It's not looks like it's not working on my computer. Which one? Okay. Let's start this again. Share screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you see the full screen? No. No, it's not. Hmm. This is very strange. Is the other one where you are? Okay. Uh, That's hundred percent. See it? No, no, no. It's still showing. Not that you can see one icon before that. Yeah. This the first one. Let me see. This is normal. Yeah. Uh, slide quarter. Next, 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 next one. one. Slide show. Yes. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good thing is we are on this one. I just think, I just said I become nature's best photography African judge. No, uh, it, Nikon photo no, but you, still, I just it's, it's, it's now. It is still not working. What? Uh it's still not showing the full screen. Okay. So let me give me one minute, okay? I yes. Or, Excel, or, um, or you can uh, you can show the uh, instead of sharing the just the screen you can show share the whole screen. Yeah, I see it here. Slide show. No, no, no. When you press on share screen, instead of going to PowerPoint, you have an option to uh, share the entire screen. You can click on that. PowerPoint. You can you can uh, stop sharing this. Sorry, one moment. Just give me one moment. I think this happened from yesterday uh, when I show the. Uh, right now, it's not controlled by me. Just one moment, okay? Yeah, yeah. Let me just uh, re-enter the room. Give me one moment. Okay. Yeah, there is look like a small technical issue. Uh, we have tested it yesterday. I'm not uh, sure. Uh, hopefully we will be able to sort it in a minute or two yeah let him come back yeah yeah he is one person who is known for hunt you know like he you should check his profile and see his hunting image he, he posts mostly on facebook uh, yes. profile yes and uh, no or, he's not at all active can, on instagram you can check his uh, website you will see all the beautiful photos over there 
and it's not just hunt images anything anything he got it he touched or anything which he post is amazing yeah that's what he call it as storytelling yes so there are i mean when it comes to his skill since hunt it's spectacular and when it comes to his skill as presenting in an artistic way that is amazing uh, so the website name hermi uh, someone is asking the uh, okay i'll type it for the website name Uh, can press F five for no, MT no, no. keyboard. Does it as, work? It's Jeffrey Fro uh, Jeffrey Wu Photography dot com. Okay, yeah, Jeffrey's back. Uh, uh, share this. Jeff, when you share, you can share. Uh, there's an option for share and their screen. You can do that. The first option. Yeah. Yeah. What about that? Are we seeing the full screen? No. No. Okay. Now I lost. We go okay. to go to share. Go to share screen, right? Yeah, yeah. share screen, and go you have share. An you have an option for entire screen. The first option. The video file. No, no. And no. the first option, entire screen. On the three tabs above. On share. Yeah, yeah. share screen. Then uh, share screen once again, and the first option, entire screen. Screen sharing is easier or not? Okay, share yeah. screen. Yeah. Entire screen. Okay. Yes. yes. Then entire share that. Entire screen. Okay. Let me see. Share. I see. Yeah. And then yeah. I use a PowerPoint in full screen, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now try to make it full screen. Please. Yeah, you yeah. can. Uh, is that okay a, now? There is yeah, a small okay. tab. You can uh, click on that hide. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. don't see me. You see the screen, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Just let keep that way. Perfect. Yes. Sorry, no, everybody, no. <laughs> about this glitch. Um, Oh, uh, where were we? Were. Yeah, uh, in 2018, I judged the Nikon photo contest. And also, as um, you know, um, in this year, in April, I become the uh, Canadian, uh, uh, Kenya Tourist Board brand partner. And uh, I think the, uh, most people know me um, um, really on the social media is from 2019 when I, when I, um, uh, what was this image when we captured February 2018? I was with uh, professional photograph tour, um, uh, six photographers. Um, we were in Mara, I photographed this image, and uh, and this image created a uh, uh, um, international sensation for for wire photography and. Uh, it was published next day, published in 27 international photographic, uh, international newspapers, including the Times, Daily Post, Daily Express. Oh. As far as, you know, the this one, the uh, bottom right corner, the Guardian, that was Queensland Guardian in Australia. Okay. So, and because of this image, I was known as a cheetah flipper. And uh, last year, August issue, African Geographic, um, the cover story issue is the uh, article I co-wrote with uh, Dr. Elena Shilicheva. It's a story about the uh, Tanobora, the five cheetah boys. And 
quote in in I just read the quote in African Geographic. It says the Jeffrey Wu is an expert on photographing cheetah hunting. He has photographed more than three hundred cheetah hunt scenarios since twenty thirteen. And um, uh, uh, many magazines did a portfolio on me, um, including the East Africa Conservation Magazine Swara, Chinese National Geographic. Um, um, African National Geographic, Canadian Camera, Culture Geographic, etc. So um, my work and article has been uh, published in more than 80 publications worldwide. Um, the, uh, um, actually, right now I'm writing a column for Chinese National Geographic um, every year, about uh, three columns for the uh, um, Africa. And also I'm a, a Nikon China contracted commercial photographers. So as you see, uh, when 2019, when the D18, DA50 came out, uh, they used my image to um, do the advertising for this camera. Um, actually, th th this uh, these advertising images was in all Chinese, uh, almost every Chinese uh, photographic magazines for a year. And I wrote a book, Beauty of the Wild, a wildlife photography field guide. Uh, it's the very first uh, Chinese language uh, um, um, photographic field guide book. And uh, I did an exhibition in uh, United Nations uh, New York head office and also did uh, a lecture there. And, and also I'm a curator. I organized uh, two big um, photographic uh, exhibition in China in 2017 and 2018. Um, I think many of you will be will know the onex.com, um, the the biggest uh, photographic online gallery. I actually organized the um, one uh, on the 10 years anniversary. I think in 2018, I organized the uh, onex.com. Uh, the Decade Premium Work Exhibition in Shanghai. And also I'm an uh, expert on high ISO photographic uh, uh, work process. Um, as you can see, some images are photographed at ISO 51,200, 25,600, etc. And also I travel in many African countries. I lead the tours. Um, also, uh, I teaching the uh, wildlife photography workshop. So um, enough of me, I think. Um, uh, right now, let's go into the lecture. First, I want to talk about is evolution of the wildlife photography in the digital era. Here you see two images, um, which um, actually this photographer who captured these two images is um, the former National Geographic photographer, Art Worthy. Uh, I think uh, many of the, you know uh, Art's work. And uh, he is the one actually, I had a very uh, big influence. Uh, he has a very big influence on, on, on me. Uh, actually, he's probably one of the reason I became a wildlife photographer from a landscape photographer when in the film time. I was shooting mainly the uh, mainly the uh, uh, mainly the uh, uh, landscape photography, and, and since digital started, I've become the wildlife photographer. The image on the left is if you see Art's work, um, that's one of his early work. And I have to point out this both image uh, is photographed in the film time. In the film time, the wildlife photography's threshold is very high. Only a few of the professionals can is they are able to do that because the cost. At that time, uh, we don't have enough information sharing online like right now. The travel cost is high. Etc. So at that time, for instance, the bald eagle. In 1990s, those images are published in the National Geographic magazine. 
However, right now, if you see what I have, uh, the National Geographic or any professional uh, geographic magazine or photographic magazine, this kind of image will not get published. Um, or in photographic competition, this kind of image, a bird in flight or a perching bird uh, doing nothing, this, uh, those images in the photographic competition very likely score an uh, average of 6 to 6.5. You will never win a award with this kind of image. So in digital era, an image like this will be winning uh, the award um, that is 2015, uh, that's an um, American photographic competition called George Glenny Award, which in Boston, um, this image is my, uh, this image won the uh, best bird image. You can see that's a two bird fighting for a catfish. I photographed this image in uh, Seattle in 2014, I believe. And in 2012, first time I went to Maryland, United States, in Conowingo Den. Right now, many of you, if you live in North America, you will know this image. It's great for the uh, bald eagle shot because the den practically stopped the uh, migration of the American chat fish. So the fish have to take days, even weeks, to climb and use the fish ladder. Uh, like it's like a step thing uh, uh, to to jump over this dam. So the main migration of those fish will be stopped in front of this dam every year for a very longer period of time. And that's the time when all the American, that's about the 90 to 150 every year in October, uh, you, you have the uh, uh, um, bald eagle fishing there every day. So you, you, if you see that, top right corner, that platform. On 2012, when I first time went there with my friend Raymond Ballo from Canada to photograph Bald Eagle, that time there's only 12 photographers, I remember very vividly. And right now, uh, that two image was taken on 2016 and 2019. Right now, every year in that den, that's about three, 400 uh, wildlife photographers trying to do the uh, fish eagle shot. So what that means is in digital era, the technology of digital photography um, from the equipment to post-processing has been advanced so fast. In one or two years is a changing of generation. And the that's number one. Number two is online, we have the uh, tremendous amount of the information being sharing of the travel. And also, as people all know, uh, that the travel expense is lower nowadays in comparison with 1990s. So what happened is there are so many images of the same subject being uploaded to the internet every year. For instance, if we go to Google, we search, uh, we type in uh, cheetah images, and then you just click on the image, you will see instantly it comes out says there are 53 million images of cheetah. Of course, um, most of the cheetah image was photographed by the tourist or the um, uh, uh, the tourist and also the uh, uh, photo enthusiast um, online, and you can see most of the cheetah image here is the, uh, for instance, the first one is a cheetah standing, second one cheetah running, third one cheetah sitting, fourth one cheetah sitting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is. These are the image which you very commonly see in the uh, internet, and uh, there are so many of them. But uh, for me, um, as a as a professional photographer, um, if even if I may be taking an image like this, I will not showing you on the social media. 
or if I am a professional photographer, I will not use this kind of image to join a photo competition. And also the the um, magazines and newspapers, they will not publish image like this. So what kind of image I will show in you for the cheetah is something like that. In the digital era, if you really want your work to be known, if you really want to uh, come out of, if not hundreds of thousands, but millions of photographers from all over the world, you have to capture very compelling images. So what is compelling image? The definition to me to compelling image is you see this image, you, you will say, damn, I wish I shot that, this kind of image. So that's a cheetah image I usually share on the uh, internet. So, and this is, those are the images which is memorable. You can, people will remember this kind of image. So many of us, uh, especially the beginners and the photo enthusiasts, they bought the camera, sometimes a very, very good camera, 1D Canon, 1D X Mark II, 600, uh, F4 lens, and that's a very common uh, standard and all Nikon D6, D5 with 600 F4 is very standard uh, equipment in Masamara if you see any uh, photographic tours. People usually um, do not have problem um, to equip with this kind of professional gear. But the image, photographer use the image to say, to, to, to say something about themselves. The images Many of us, we capture the image, but we don't know whether this image is good or not. Uh, sometimes you see a work, you know this is a good image, but why this is image is good? I, they cannot really pinpoint the point, uh, pinpoint uh, what's made this image a great image. So for me, um, I think, um, because I start judging photographic competition since uh, 2012, and uh, I have some um, uh, ideas about, uh, as an uh, international photographic judge, uh, when we're judging a photographic competition, what we are really looking for, what make an image standing out is different than I think most of the people to, um, uh, to perceive. Um, that's what I call, there are four levels of wildlife photography. Um, I just use a very uh, common uh, subject, a kingfisher, to, the, um, to, to demonstrate what, what that means, the four levels of wildlife photography. Let's back to this. So most of us, we start photograph the wildlife starting from the birds, because if we were living in Canada, in India, in China, in United States, we do not really have, let's say, access to photograph a cheetah, a lion, or a tiger instantly. What most commonly photographed subject is bird. Most of our wildlife photographers, we start with the photographing the bird. Uh, for instance, you may not be a wildlife photographer yet. That day you just have a 7200 millimeter lens with a camera. You are photographing your children playing soccer in the school, or you photographing the uh, photographing the uh, um, uh, 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 family portrait. And on the way home, there's a bird who is injured or who who is just too tired to fly, he's standing on the uh, tree branch, just like three, four meters above your head, even when you approaching him in like 500, uh, uh, like five meters, he's not flying away, and then you are able to capture something like that. So this is the, what do we call the entry level or beginner's work of photography. Of course, from photographic, 
uh, language, this is a very well focused, very well composed image. Background is super smooth because the uh, the background is very far from the bird and, and you are very close to the bird. So you can see very clearly what this species look like. Uh, it has the green head, you know, black uh, and red beak, you know, um, orangey chest, uh, the, the yellow chest, orange claws. So this is pretty much what why we started. We photograph the appearance of a species and we try to get background as smooth as possible, as blur as possible, the main subject is as clear as possible, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I we, we established. This is the entry level. So second one, sorry, second one, second level of wildlife photography, what I call is the action shot or the motion shot is when animals start moving. They either run or fly. For instance, burning fly, B-R-A-F shot is uh, um, the, um, I think most of the uh, um, advanced wildlife photographer who is also always pursuing this kind of shot, you know. And uh, for whoever had done this knows from the perching shot, a static shot to a bird in flight shot, it's a super difficult. It's very, very difficult. However, after a while, after practice, you will have this kind of uh, um, uh, bird in flight shot. But uh, this bird in flight shot actually covers the content of the previous static shot like this, because in this image, you also can see very specifically uh, the bird appearance, what it looked like. The only difference in comparison to the first one is this one is in action, is in flight. However, from the real content of this in terms of the bird behavior, we know the first one is we know what this bird look like. The second one, we know, oh, this bird can fly. So you add a little bit storytelling value by telling this species behavior. But this is uh, is difficult to achieve, but after you are able to achieve this kind of shot, it becomes easier. However, this is not really a professional shot yet. A professional level of photography, at least you have something like that. So this is the same bird. Now you can see this bird go into the water and come out. So it's, it covers previous two images content, what this bird look like, it, what its appearance is. Number two is we uh, demonstrate the bird can fly. Third, you add a more storytelling value to this image by use this image to tell your viewer is this bird can go into the water and fly out. This bird can dive into the water. So this image in any photographic competition is easier to score about 7.5 to 8 points. But if I'm to showing you the image, it's not like that. I will be showing you the another level of um, image of this bird, which is this. So this image, it covers all the content of previous three images. You can see, number one, you can see all birds of uh, this species appearance. Number two is you demonstrate that one of the behavior that this bird can fly. Third, you demonstrate one of the behavior that this bird can dive into the water. But this image is ultimate demonstration of this bird that why it goes into the water because it wants to catch a fish. So with a fish struggling the beak, this is uh, uh, what do we call maximum amount level of storytelling. So if we look at this full image again, this is appearance, this is birding flight, we add a little bit of a behavior to the appearance. This is the bird can fly and also can dive. The fourth is the bird can, the appearance, bird can fly, bird can dive, and why? Because 
he wants to get the food. So you can see the four different level of storytelling uh, value added to this image. But for me, I probably I shot all four of them, but I never show you first three. Because why I never show you first three? Because first three image is too common. And to me, the story value is not at a maximum level yet. So if I show you a Kingfisher image, I will only show you this one. When we have a good image uh, to, to show in the Facebook or Instagram, right away you have lots of uh, um, people, um, your mother, your, your wife, your sister, um, your co-worker, they will right away give you a thumb up, you know, awesome. But trust me, um, the awesomeness in the Facebook and uh, Instagram is not really a standard to judge your images become awesome or not. So uh, because the all people that you know, um, or at least in comparison to what they can photograph, your image is better than theirs. So what is the standard? to tell this image is good or not. It's very simple, um, photographic competition. So photographic competition, um, they are basically, there are two different groups of photographic competition. Number one is Salon, which we know um, there is PSA, Photographic uh, Society of America, um, FIAP, um, the Federation of International Photographic <laughs> Excuse me. So basically, FIAP and the PSA, they are salon style of the uh, photographic competition. And the good thing for salon style photographic competition is they have set rules to uh, the, the benchmarks or the guidelines for judge to judging the uh, uh, photographic <clears throat> photographic work. And also there are different um, photographic competitions. Some, uh, some professional photo uh, photographic competition, for instance, the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition, and also the um, uh, Nature's Best uh, Photography competition, etc. Like these kind of, we call pro photographer competitions. Uh, pro photographer competitions, the judging criteria will be broader and uh, the judging rules will be more complicated than the salon uh, photographic competition. So basically, there are two systems. The pro photography judging will be more complicated. And usually in salon photographic competition, um, the judges, they also photographers, but and, and a, a number of judges will be uh, limited. For instance, if you go to FIAP, um, FIAP kind of uh, uh, um, FIAP system of photographic um, competition. There are only three judges, so each judge can score you from zero to ten. So maximum of the image can score to thirty. Of course, uh, hardly any image win the competition scores thirty. Usually, if three nines, twenty seven, etc. But that we don't discuss this in detail. And the professional photographer judges. Uh, photographic competition judges like BBC or Nature's Best, uh, they are different because some number of the judges will be more than three or five, seven, even sometimes you can like eight, ten judges. And not every one of them are photographers. Some of them are biologists. Some of them are magazine pub uh, publishers, uh, museum curators, etc. So that will be in more complex uh, um, judging criteria that we don't discuss there. But the basic, the the most common photographic competition or salon kind of competition, uh, as we said, um, I think in Q and A, I will be elaborate a little bit more about how a judge um, to evaluate an image, but. 
I just uh, the point here is in 2014 October 2014, all the photographic society like a uh, FIAP, like a Kappa Canadian Association of Photographic um, Photographic uh, uh, Art, and also like uh, British Royal, um, and also the uh, Australia South Africa, and also the PSA, they all issued the same what I call the uh, game-changing uh, document, which is a new definition for the uh, nature photography um, competition. And the most important change is here, which I highlight here red. The storytelling value of a photograph must be weighted more than a pictorial quality while maintaining high technique quality. So that means uh, exquisite detailed bird perching on a tree branch before October 2014 in a photographic competition because the color, because the vivid and uh, uh, clarity of the species, you may score up to like eight uh, point or nine point. But after that, basically after 2015, if you join any photo uh, wildlife photography um, photo uh, competition in the Salon system, PSA or FIA, if just a bird portrait to show in the appearance of the species without any uh, extra storytelling value, you are not get a very high score. Usually right now, in especially this few years, when you're judging the photograph company, if just a bird perching shot, you just get a six point and you will be passed. You never have a chance to win the competition. So not just the, um, the salon competition, which mainly focus on the amateur photographers. But for professional photographer competition, for instance, Nature's Best Photography Africa, this is, I believe, is 2018. Um, the one of the images that I judged. Um, and this image um, actually wins the black and white um, category is a line. But you see what kind of image it is. This is a lion hunting a buffalo. So the storytelling value, because the scene is a hunting scene, is so dramatic, full of conflict. So therefore, this image actually wins the award. So what I want to say is, it doesn't really matter which what kind of photographic competition you are uh, entering to the salon style or the professional style. Storytelling value is the key. It's the soul of the great wildlife photography. So that is what I trying to emphasize here in the first part of this lecture is wildlife photography, the soul is the great storytelling value, like that. Number two is I would like to talk about the genres of wildlife photography. Many people think uh, or they only remember my work uh, because I, I just photographed way too many um, cheetah hunting shots. So they often think the um, the wildlife photography is all about the uh, uh, cheetahs or the lions, but actually it's not. Of course, big cat is, uh, is a very popular, especially in Africa, uh, wildlife photography um, genres. However, there are different genres of wildlife photography um, um, at least for me, I'm doing uh, my main work, body spread over seven different genres. The first one, of course, is the cats. You get a cheetah hug. You get a lion hunt. Uh, any problem? Okay. No, no. Lion hunt, leopard hunt. Oh. So that is 
one of the um, most favorite uh, subject I photograph. But besides that, as I said, storytelling value is the soul of the wildlife photography. So regardless of any species, anything exciting happen, any conflict, any dramatic moment happens in the nature, that is my first priority to capture, even though they are they may not be a fancy, um, like a very beautiful uh, species like a cat. Well, this is a pretty well-known um, migration shot, uh, which is like standard setting in Africa, in Kenya especially. And also see the uh, um, fighting of two hippos. This image was taken in um, Botswana, in Chobi River. And, and you can see how severe the fight is, the actually drew the blood. Two jackals try to tear apart, uh, fighting for a uh, uh, guinea fowl. The fighting of the uh, uh, monkeys, bee eaters, of course, the um, lying mating fight. Or even, I mean, the dramatic mob may not only include the, uh, may not only including the um, the, the hunting and the fighting, well, like uh, quitting is also a very good subject, which um, has very high, um, the, uh, ha very high storytelling value. This image was published in three magazines and, uh, and sometimes in the nature, we witness something so spectacular, like we witnessed this this crocodile like six meter long, about a half ton, in Mara, um, who took down um, a Thompson gazelle, and that he just like took it under water, drawn it, and then reappear on the surface and just bam, 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 slap this gazelle three times, break into two pieces and swallow both part in two. Go this is a very how to say it a very spectacular shot and imagine this crocodile this, um, the, the Nile crocodile that's the only crocodile species in Africa the Nile crocodile never evolved for like hundred million years you mean hundred million years ago crocodile look like this and they already hunt like this is the raw power and the the sheer raw power and the brutality itself is a witness of this uh, 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 fantastic nature world we have been living in. Um, blacksmith lapwing, uh, because they are ground breeders, so they have laid the eggs and uh, while well, other species for instance, this one is the biggest heron of the world, the glia heron. Um, close to the egg, the the bird will mobbing it, and and I think this image would have really like it. You see the uh, all the feathers standing up on the uh, uh, heron's head. You see the intensity of the attack. I also do bird poetry. To me, that's a bird poetry. I will not show you a lilac bristle roller, what it look like. If I show you a lilac bristle roller, a bird shot, that bird must have something either in the beak or in the talon or in the clubs. So, because without the storytelling uh, to show the behavior of this bird, I will not show you the image. Same as the uh, Southern ground hornbill, it's very common bird in Africa, but um, this is a standard poetry shot, but look at uh, the what's uh, he's getting is uh, is a lizard and a frog. This is shot in the uh, the height for photo height photography, the photographic height in Hungary from Benson Matei's height. Uh, here and got a, a catfish. Another genre I, I do in a daily basis every morning 
and uh, afternoon sunrise sunset. Uh, what do we call animal scape? So basically, it's, it's a way of shooting a landscape, but with uh, the wildlife in the foreground as um, as a, a major point of interest, like that. Or like this, it shows a habitat of the uh, wildlife in the East Africa savannas. You see this one. Uh, you the topi is just a very small silhouette, but the topi here in this image, um, even though it's just a small silhouette, but it gives the scale of how tall this tree is, because we all know how tall the topi is. And this is the image you shot in Lake Naivasha in the morning, backlighting. And this is one of the very famous um, Zion, who is very, um, he lived a long life. His name is the Lord Puppet. Um, unfortunately, he died last year. So this probably is the last image I shot in the sunrise. Now this actually last year because of super long rain season, we have a lot of fox in Mara. So in the morning when the uh, hot air balloon taking off, you can see the giraffe in the uh, fog uh, running and walking. And this one, this giraffe was chased by a hyena uh, because of baby. So um, it's just very like a fairy tale thing to, to photograph. And in the morning, the or in the uh, in the morning, uh, the first light hit the secondary bird will taking off from the uh, perched tree from the nest. You, uh, all you need to do is the day before you see the nest is there. Next morning, you just wait before sunrise. When first light hit, they will start taking off. And also, last year the ring season created lots of rainbow shot for the Mara. And besides that, um, as I said, I, I'm a professional wildlife photographer. Um, the professional wildlife photographer, there are actually two terminologies. Number one is a skill set. So professional wildlife photographer can be a skill, uh, can be a terminology to describe a skill set of a photographer. His image is reaching the professional level. However, it's not a career choice. Like my uh, very good friend, I recently did an uh, interview with him. It's a, um, a Canadian wildlife photographer, um, Thomas Vigian. Um, if any of you are familiar with his work, he just won the uh, Natural Photographer of the Year Award um, uh, last month, and I did an interview. The interview will be aired within one or two weeks um, on, on my Facebook page and uh, and the uh, um, and the YouTube, but anyway, to, like Thomas, he he's a professional level photographer, no doubt. But he actually do not do this for a living. He is an um, uh, um, entrepreneur. He owns a, a multinational company. But for me, I'm also the professional photographer. Not just describe my skill set. It's also um, describe my career choice. So my income is um, is uh, all related to wildlife photography. For instance, I'm leading tours, teaching uh, work work um, workshops, publish books, um, publish my images articles in the uh, uh, magazines, and newspapers, doing lectures, um, curating the exhibitions. And also another point is selling the work, uh, especially collectibles. It's very, very interesting. The <coughs> excuse me. Um, I have the galleries and the private collectors um, um, collect my image. Mainly, ninety-nine percent of my collectible image are black and white. 
So I do a um, fair certain amount of the uh, black and white uh, photography as well, fine art of photography. And also, because I started in the film time, I started with the black and white film uh, for the landscape. So I always have a need, have, have some uh, an emotional attachment to black and white image. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, genre of the photography. Black and white is moody, especially for the uh, uh, landscape, the, the wildlife landscape shot. And also, I just really like the tonality changing in the black and white images. Um, it, it just suits me. And it can, black and white is also good beside the, uh, the landscape shot. It also is very good in terms of describing the uh, character of the wildlife as well. And this is a scar, the one of the, I think the, the most famous lying in Masamara now. He's 17 years old, he's a world record. No lions in the wild living to 17 years old besides this one. And this lion appeared in at least five BBC uh, documentary films. Uh, another cheetah called Selenke and the cubs. Um, the mood is what I really want, especially right now. Right now is a uh, rain season in Mara, and you get in the afternoon when the rain storm start rolling, you get lots of this kind of dramatic skies. I often uh, will looking for the subject, usually a bigger wildlife like um, elephants or giraffes, use a wide angle lens, get, try to get as close as possible to photograph them. The dramatic sky contrast, very calm um, um, animal. Um, it's a very moody thing for me to capture. And of course, besides the hunting, fighting, chasing, killing, one of the most popular genres of the wildlife flag is love and the tenderness. It's heartwarming, uh, especially the cup shots, the cup with mother, play with mother. And this is uh, one of the very famous cheetah who already passed away for three years. That's Malaika's last letter. And this one photographed last year uh, in Mara. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the, uh, I think this is, uh, Quali with the uh, cup, yeah, with a single cup. And this is also Quali's cup. And this image was published in the People magazine last year uh, in October, I believe. The cup shot. And this is uh, also the one of the tragedy. This um, cheetah is um, um, this cheetah is Imani, um, which is a flipping cheetah, the, the, one of my most famous um, cheetah flipping in the air shot. That's the cheetah Imani. Last year um, in November, we see her with four cups and uh, very sadly, these four cups all died in March due to bad weather and also the, uh, the bad weather uh, and also the other predators like uh, um, um, hyenas and the lion. So I, I think that um, the, I, I don't know how many people know that, the wild cheetah cub surviving rate is about 15 to 20%. So actually it is common for cheetah loss, lots of cub and even loss sometimes like this case, it lost the whole letter. So that's uh, actually one of the all-purpose, all all-purpose, all-mission for wildlife photography is 
bring this kind of uh, awareness to the public. And this is a shot we did last year in October. I think the the um, that baby Toby just born. And this is uh, I shot this in Amboseli actually. Well, sometimes you can see the nurturing. And this baby is big. It's almost the same size as a mother, but it's still suckle, and the mother still let it. It's very fascinating for the, uh, the the animal world. And who will not lo love something like that? Hide photography. Hide photography started actually um, from 1990s. Started with the um, I think the National Geographic photographers. They use a hide and also they use a flashlight to photograph the um, uh, difficult approaching images and, and the species. And also at night, I think the one who really perfect hide photography is uh, Benza Mateo of Hungary. If you go to Google, to Google the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year, you see the chart. He is still number one. That means he wins the most of the uh, BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year award. Benson Mate is expert in height photography. He's also a very good friend of mine. He actually is my European partner. So every year I have a two, three tours go to his height in Hungary. And he perfect height building. In um, Africa, I think a few years ago, if you uh, came to Africa a few years ago for height photography in Zimanga, South Africa, he built that, he designed and built the manga a hide. But what I'm showing you this is a hide newly built last year, actually finished last year, October, in Lanturi, um, which I think the, the, uh, since last year, October, I start to post the image I photographed in Lanturi. Uh, it become an internet sensation. Right now it becomes uh, uh, the, most popular high photography destination in the world now. And you can see the species here. The good thing about the Lantori Lodge in Kenya is they are in the time, in the area, geographically, they are in four microclimate zone. They are desert basin kind of weather, rainforest weather, and also high plateau grassland and bushland, four kind of micro weather system there. So you see, and that camp is located in the forest. So you will see so many um, species in that area. Usually you don't see them anywhere else, like uh, white tail mangoes, uh, caracal, uh, leopard, uh, of course, giraffe, and uh, lions, and also civic cat, the one, you know, the, the civic coffee, the most expensive coffee from, from uh, come from the uh, deposit of these cats. Of course, it's not in Africa, it's Southeast Asia, but that's a civic cat. Caracals, lions, etc. So what I really love the, um, I really love the height photography because it, it, when animal at night come to the spotlight light up uh, water pond to drinking the water. They cannot see you. All they see is a reflection. You 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 can see many of the images. The animal just look straight into your lens because what they see actually is a reflection uh, of the window. So at night they will see another lion approaching them. So they keep uh, always watching that line, keep an eye uh, on that line. That line actually is their own reflection. So you get this very, very good uh, uh, straight up uh, um, portrait. Very fascinating. Another one is area of photography. Um, I think in Africa, area of photography, uh, mainly we referring to the image which taken from a helicopter um, not, um, not uh, how to say, it, not a uh, drone. So the most um, famous destination for aerial photography will be Lake Nature in Tanzania. Actually, not many people know that is in rain season, Lake Nature actually expand 
into the into the uh, um, Kenya side. And also there is another lake in Kenya called Lake Magadi, which is about um, 15 kilometers from the Lantori Hide, uh, Lantori Lodge in Kenya, are uh, one of the best um, um, area photography, helicopter area photography destination in the world. So we get something like that. And some of you may ask, why is the water is black? Of course, if you know the African wildlife photography, you know the color and the patterns who is floating on the top layer of the uh, top of the lake surface because they are saline lake. They are different kind of mineral composite. Um, when the lake is super salty, Actually, the pH level on those lakes are pH 12. So it's almost like, uh, um, like um, it's almost like toxic. But the Lake Makali, they are not only the biggest um, natural soda ash, which is CO2, where the CO2 bubble come from, from all the Coca-Cola and uh, Pepsi um, drink. And that lake is, besides that, that lake is highly toxic because a high pH level. And you have this kind of, especially after storm, after rain season, you have this different color just floating on top of the, on top of the uh, lake surface. Um, but um, we all know the lake surface is dark green color. Why this lake surface is black? The trick is, we photograph them in the middle of the day, like 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, when the sun shining directly to the root lake surface and the, the flamingo. So if you photograph a flamingo at this time, when you do the photograph, you, we can see this one very clearly. When you, when you do the metering, because the flamingo is so small, if you want to really get the details of the white color flamingo in direct sunlight at mid of the day, you need to underexpose. So the lake surface is dark green color, but while you underexpose to stop, you have the background, the, the dark green color becomes black. So, and then you're just increasing the contrast, you get image like that. It's very, very beautiful. And there, this is uh, the Lake Natron, uh, not Lake Makati, but this Lake Natron is on the Kenya side. So we are able to photograph them in 2019 in the rain season, or 2018, I think, in the rain season. Um, and that year actually, um, that's a lot of rain. So um, there's a lot of uh, chemical deposit and also the, the for Lake Nature, you often have this very golden color um, pattern floating on top of the lake. They are actually uh, the yellow soil was flushed down from the Serengeti Masamara Plateau into the lake just after storm. And because the water is so salty, so those dirt will not uh, <coughs> will will not fall into the bottom of the lake. Instead of they floating on top of the lake with the wing, and it become different weird colors like this kind of color plate for a uh, color palette for the oil painting. And this one actually resembles a human head. So I call this image the uh, alien navigator, like an alien. And it was last, uh, I think, uh, 2018 October issue, Chinese National Geographic. And this is the cover story um, of this image. And in different season, for instance, after ring season, when there's enough, um, enough fresh water in the lake, so lake is not as salty, and that time you will see the green algae growing in the lake. So um, at that time, the pattern of the lake will have this green tone, uh, which 
uh, you see from here that indication of the time after rain season, you have a pattern like this. And this is also in the helicopter. Um, it, it is in on the sunset, the last light, um, you see a um, group of uh, um, zebra, a herd of zebra just crossing the shallow water of the lake to the other side to reach the uh, uh, grassland is just inspiring. That's where the um, river flow into the lake, the, the, um, the, uh, um, in the Lake Nation. So basically, uh, um, for the past um, 45 minutes, we talk about different genres of wildlife taxi. It's not just because, it's not just cats. It's all the dramatic moments, all the animals landscape, all the black and white fine art, and also the the loving and tenderness of the uh, interaction of the uh, cubs and the mother, and also the aerial photography, height photography, etc. All these are all the genres of the wildlife photography. So um, that is basically a broad scale of how wildlife photography, when we referring to this terminology, can cover the field. So now for the last part, we talk about uh, the photographing in wildlife in Africa. And uh, I really love Masai Mara. Um, I mean, um, I've been traveling many, many different countries in Africa, Botswana, Z uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, South Africa, Namibia, uh, Ethiopia, etc. Tanzania, of course. Um, but I really love Masai Mara is every year. Masai Mara is like most concentrated, besides the animal, is most concentrated with the professional wildlife photographer. Some of the best wildlife photographers, they will come to Masai Mara almost every year as long as they, they are shooting the Africa scene. Masai Mara only has, in terms of area, only occupies one-tenth of the whole um, East Africa savannas. Um, and everybody know in Tanzania side, that's 90% of East Africa savanna is located in uh, Tanzania side we call Serengeti. And the, the rest of one tenth in the East Africa savanna in Kenya we call Masai Mara. So Masai Mara is a small, it's only 3,000 kilometers uh, square. But the most dramatic crossing happened every year from July to September in Mara, everybody know. Um, and also the good thing I really love Masai Mara is, uh, in Kenya is, we are so compact, you can get a lion um, walking the sunrise at six o'clock, you photograph the cheetah hunt at uh, uh, 12 o'clock, and in the afternoon, three o'clock, you may have a chance to photograph a leopard jumping over a cliff. So, and, and all the um, subjects are compact and very, um, very easy to have access into. But in Tanzania, I remember I was in Grumedi, I photographed the uh, uh, lion pride for three days, and then we want to photograph the cheetah. We have to drive like lots of hours and drive to uh, Ditut for the cheetah shot. So um, for, for, for Masai Mara, in comparison to the advantage of the photography is it's compact, it's easy accessible. And have a same, even if it's not bigger, uh, higher the wildlife density uh, in comparison to Serengeti. That's the reason I I went to Serengeti on 2013, 2014, and 2016. But right now, basically, I'm not going there because just because from one point to another point to photograph just too um, too long of the travel. We got everything here in Mara. 
So photographing in wildlife in Africa is the key for me um, through the years of photography. Um, I started doing professional wildlife photography since 2013 in Africa. I spent eight to 10 months per year in here. And uh, I just want to share some tricks and uh, technique part uh, to the uh, uh, fellow photographers here who not being Africa as many as uh, as as often as as they 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 would. Number one, getting closer. Um, I think the uh, Magnum founder of the Magnum, um, Robert Kappa, uh, who is very famous um, uh, uh, war photographer, photojournalist. He has a very famous quote is, if your picture aren't good enough because you are not close enough. However, how close is too close to drive to the animal five, three meters is harassment, it's not close. However, um, for me, I often think the close is you have freedom of the off-road driving, um, which you can choose appropriate distance to the wildlife to capture the meat you want. So if we just join the uh, regular uh, tour group to Mara, of course, we all know we can only stay in the... Uh, in the uh, um, road. Um, if you want to get off-road permit, you have to apply and you don't know take how long and spend how much money to get off-road permit. So um, I started with photography in the conservancy of the Mara, uh, namely Olari or Rock Conservancy, uh, Nabushu Conservancy or all Kenyan Conservancy. The good thing about the conservancy is you can off-road 24 hours and you always have a less vehicle, fewer vehicle, and fewer photographers there, and you can do an off-road um, to get the, uh, get the uh, uh, um, satisfying distance to photograph. Instead of in the park, you probably stay in the road photographing cannibal hunting from like 120 meters away. So that's one of the key points. So I would start, uh, um, recommend people come to Mara, start it if you really want to get very good driving and photographing experience starting, um, or at least including part of your journey in the conservancy. The down part, of course, because conservancy is, uh, um, has less density of the camps, so they are expensive. But the good thing is if you pay more expensive accommodation in conservancy, those money go directly to the landowner, which is Maasai people who donated this land for the use of the conservancy. So you, you are doing the conservation work while you stay in the uh, conservancy camps. Number two is right gear. Um, right gear is, I think is the most, most, um, what is the right gear is the most um, misleading um, concept, uh, misleading, um, how to say it, perception uh, among all the photographers, advanced cover, even lots of uh, uh, pro photographers. Because um, when I am in Mara, I see so many photographers, they bring their wrong gear. So why we say that? Because what's your main um, lens for the um, wildlife photography in Africa. Everybody will tell you that will be 500 f4, 600 f4, or 800 f5.6 prime lens. If that's your main lens, I'm sorry, you won't get shot like this. Um, let me just tell you the, sto uh, the story about this shot is I have been photographing cheetah more than 300 times. The most, the best lens for photographing cheetah is a zoom lens. So currently I'm using uh, 180 to 400 um, millimeter um, Nikon zoom lens, 
with 1.4 teleconverter building. And in the history, I have used, when I'm using Canon gear, I use 200, 400 f4 with 1.4 teleconverter building, and also 100 to 400 um, millimeter um, lens with 1.4 teleconverter um, match with the uh, 1DX Mark II. I've been using that setting for two years. So why? Because if you really want to capture an uh, astonishing um, cheetah hunt, instead of photographing the cheetah hunt from behind, you're only photographing cheetah and the prey is a butt, you have to go past the prey. You have to make a determination or a prediction where this hunt is going to be stopped. And when the cheetah running country, see cheetah is the fastest land animal in the whole world. Uh, it can starting from zero uh, kilometers per hour, hiding the bush until it reaches top speed at 120 kilometers per hour in 2.3 seconds. That means in 2.3 seconds, they can run about, uh, eight, um, uh, about the uh, um, 70, 80 meters. So for me, I all, always trying to capture the cheetah with the prey from the head on front uh, direction of 45 uh, degree angle. To photograph that kind of scenery, that means cheetah start from very far. And when they getting close to a prey, or when they start trying to um, to chase and hunt the prey, there will be the distance between the cheetah and the photographer will be changing in like uh, in two three seconds will be changing like a like a 40 50 meters. So the only practical usage of the um, uh, the, the long lens to photograph cheetah is a zoom lens. Uh, it's very simple. I think many, I don't know if any photographers in today's seminar also um, was with me in the same, uh, in the same scenario, uh, in the same uh, scenario in Mara. Um, if you analyze the hunt, and I mean, if we have like in high season, we have a 15, 20, um, photographers in the vehicle to photographing cheetah hunt for the same scenario. At night, everybody posts up the uh, the daily uh, images. I always can capture the most dramatic moment because I'm using the zoom lens. In two seconds, I can zoom back from 400 meters, 180 meters, while at the same time maintaining the focus. That's the advantage of the zoom lens. However, most of the uh, the um, the uh, photographers they all use prime lens, 600 f4. So, 600 f4 lens. When you start to focusing the cheetah from very far, like from 80 meters away, you get the, the cheetah in the right size. But when they run in two seconds in front of you, like 30, 40 meters. Um, you will be out of frame. Okay, you will be out of frame, so you, you miss the best shot like this. This is a typical image um, that what I have had uh, when I'm leading tours. This image was captured in February 2019. Um, just around the double cross area. Um, at that time, we have, I do believe we have 12 vehicles to photograph this cheetah. And our group have two vehicles. Our, our group has um, six photographers. So five of them was using zoom lens. Another one, no, four of them was using zoom lens. Another two, Against my advice, uh, they bring the the prime lens 600 f4 lens. So we pretty much determined the cheetah uh, running route. So we went to the other side of the herd of the Impala to photograph this scenery. And what happened is when cheetah start to chasing them, the Impala like 
the, the whole herd of impala like explosion and they all start to run. That's dust everywhere. You cannot even ask, actually seeing the um, uh, where the cheetah is. And also this kind of dust and the kill all will also confuse the cheetah, lost his previous target. So what it does is he changes the direction running toward us. And in the kill and all the dust, um, there's a female gazelle, a female impala running actually um, uh, get the uh, um, get confused. It running toward the cheetah. So, but when it sees the cheetah, it's too late. The cheetah is two meters away. So it starts to jump. I have to point out, even with all the zoom lens that we are using, because we are so close, and this is only a matter of two, three seconds, you don't have time to change it another shorter focal lens. Um, so even with zoom lens, we have four phot photographers in the car capture this scenery. But because they are so close, so each photographer all capture just one or two frames, just a few frames of this action because like, like this image, this is the first image I captured when the cheetah is in the air. Like 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 completely horizontal. The second one, because it's so close, even I already reduced to 180 uh, millimeter focal lens. The tail and the leg of this cheetah is all out of frame. So this is the only image I can use in the whole like uh, 15 images I captured. So we can start seeing how close we are. So this is uh, this photographer name is Zhang Xiaohong. She is a female photographer <coughs> in our group. She was using 100, 400 um, zoom lens uh, with 1.4 teleconverter and 1DX Mark II. So she was photographing from the other car, which is about three meters ahead of us. She captured the the moment when the Impala saw the cheetah come, realized she is so close to the cheetah. So she started taking off, try to jump over cheetah's head. And the cheetah at the same time rise with this Impala, fall it into the air. But see this photographer, because it's so close, this photographer only get these two images. The third one, the Impala's head is out of frame. So this only two these two images she can use. So the third image of this series is mine, which as I indicated, because it's so close, that's the only one image I can use. The second one, the tail and the leg is out of the frame of this thing. And another photographer right beside me, her name's Liu Yi, um, and many of them um, you see this image won the uh, Big Shot competition last year, two years ago, and uh, a few photographic uh, competitions. Um, and many of them, they expressed the concerns that Jeff, they actually messaged me to the Jeff, I saw somebody using your image during the competition. I said, no, that's not my image. That's the photographer right beside me. And uh, she was using 100, 400, uh, zoom lens with 1DX. So, but she started, um, the, this is the first two images she started. She is a little bit slower than I, so I did, I captured the, the, the moment of the, of the cheetah is completely horizontal. So when she starts shooting, the cheetah actually already start descending. But I actually, to me, I prefer her image than mine, the reason being is, if you see my image, uh, because I use 180 uh, millimeter lens with 1.4 teleconverter, I don't have enough time to turn down the 1.4 teleconverter. So this one is a shot like a 200 millimeter lens. And uh, it's uh, so close that 
I can only capture the tip of the grass. And for her image, because she was using 100 millimeters, so she actually captured the, the ground. So from the ground, you can see how high the Impala and the uh, Cheetah was. So she is able to get four shots out of this action. And, and then after the, and, and if you pay attention, you see on my image, the cheetah's paw here did not just start grabbing the side of the impala. But the second one for the, the uh, Miss Liu Yi's uh, image, you can see the blood start coming out here. You can see the blood drop. And this one, you already can see it actually took down, tear apart a piece of skin from the impala. So the cheetah put the impala down and then jump again, uh, made the kill. So this image is the first photographer. His name is Mr. Bai Ming. Uh, very unfortunately, he was using a 600 millimeter lens to capture this. So when he photographed the uh, cheetah uh, in the air, um, it's too close. So what happened is he dropped the uh, 600 millimeter, take down another camera with 70, 200, but he missed the most excellent part of the action, which is this series. So let's see this, and this is the first one. The Impala saw the uh, cheetah start to jump up. And then in the, in the air, cheetah start fall it, jump in the air, start to pull it down to the ground, and then jump again, uh, kill the uh, Impala. So what my point here is, if me and my group of the photographer was using the prime lens, they will never get a shot like that. Never. And this, this is a very typical scenario analysis. And actually, it happened more often than the, uh, um, than the, uh, uh, than the, uh, more often than, than we expected. This is not like a rare case. It's very common because the people who use 600 millimeter lens miss a lot of shot because they don't have enough time to reduce the focal lens or change another camera. So that's the uh, right gear. Another reason I want to emphasize the importance of using the zoom lens is it gives you more freedom of creativity. For instance, the, uh, this is the image shot with, uh, with, uh, um, a sh and, and this is the image was captured by one of my students who was uh, with me in the, uh, when I'm leading a tour, he, he was with me in my car. And you see this uh, lion pull this dead um, topi, try to drag this dead topi. Very, um, very naturally, it's the very first time you see something like this happening, you want to capture the whole thing. So um, at that time, I think he was using the same same kind of uh, same uh, same lens as I do. We both use the uh, uh, 100 400. That was 20, 2018, I believe. 2017, 2017, actually. We both were using the 100 uh, 400 zoom lens with the 1DX Mark II. So he captured this. But for me, I've been photographing this kind of a scenario many, many times. For him, it's the first time. So what I want to think is when I see this, I did not shoot right away as I was thinking what I want to present here to the viewer, because I know everybody will shoot the image like this, but I want to shoot something different. So what I'm trying to see is uh, where is the story in this image? What is, how can I maximize the storytelling value of the image? So to me, this thing appeared to me is the most compelling element is 
the lion's head and the Toby's head. You can see the eyes of a vicious predator and the eye already lost the life. The, it's a lifeless image. So right away when he was using 100 millimeter to photographing the whole body, whole scenery, I zoom in to 100, 400 at the 400 side. That's my image here. I only shot part of this part of the uh, the scene and also I zoom in to the head of the image. And this is the, so that, that's what I'm always trying to tell people is the subjective perspective of uh, um, creative style of photographer always can recognize the scene and find his own way, own approach to maximize the storytelling value, or the or uh, um, the maximize, or, or, or to show his own style. So to me, story is number one, and the the objective to maximize the story in the scenery is is the key. And uh, zoom lens in the split of second the zoom lens give you a freedom to zoom in in the matter of less than one second to create something you need it. If you use the uh, 600 or prime, any prime lens, you actually lost this kind of free freedom. Let's uh, see another, analyze another scenario here. So thousand, thousand, uh, Southern Hornbill in uh, Masemara, um, I mean, in Africa, when they are hunting frogs in the ring scene, it's a very common scene. But to me, when we photograph this, is even though we are very close to this hornbill, we, I think we were about five, seven meters away from this hornbill when he's like, like tossing this frog. The most first time when people seeing this, they will naturally to compose or frame the shot like this. But to me, same, I am looking for this scene scenario and analysis, analysis this scenario is where is the story, the maximum amount of the story. It's just a head, head of the, uh, it's happening around the head of this hornbill. So my shot is this. You don't need to shoot the whole body by showing part of the image, the, the part of the scenario, you actually in magnified or increase the storytelling value of this scenery instead of to showing the whole appearance of this uh, species. So, and uh, zoom lens will provide you with this kind of flexibility, you can show this you can shut this, and at the same time, within one second, you can just push in to shoot something like this. So that's what I have been seeing. The most common mistake people made is using the prime lens. I would say at least half of the advanced or if not a professional photographer, if the Using the zoom lens in the prime lens, their number of the good image will increase dramatically. <coughs> so how to maximize this storytelling? What I say is oh, very often we just analyze, look at the scene, analyze where's the most, the biggest storytelling value of the scenario is, and sometimes it's not about the maximum amount of scenario. It's what you want to show the, the um, viewer um, by changing the narrative of the image. For instance, uh, we are um, seeing this um, lioness play with this uh, mangoose and eventually kills it. So I was using the zoom lens. So at this distance, I used the 180 to 400 millimeter at 180 um, millimeter 
side. So you get the whole body of the lion and the mongoose. In this image, the narrative of this image is what is the main point of the interest in this image is the lion. So I frame this way, lying become a dominant um, element of this image. But what for me, I really want to show the, um, the story here is not the lying, it's the mongoose. The mongoose is very desperate. Even it knows it's gonna die. He still want to do the last fight. So. But in this image, because lion is such a dominant uh, uh, visual element here, you hardly notice the mongoose. And also the, the, the size between mongoose and the lion are so different. So when you show the whole body of the lion, the size of the mongoose is very small. You cannot, you can barely see its facial expression. So after I shot this at, what, at 180 millimeter, right away, I turned the 1.4 teleconverter and uh, run my image, uh, run my lens into 560. The maximum is 400 times 1.4, 560 uh, millimeter, uh, um, the uh, focal lens. I get an image like this, the next one. So in this one, the line is not complete, but because it's not complete and the, the ratio of this mongoose increased and right now, the mongoose become the main um, uh, point of the interest. And its facial expression, its teeth, its at the neck and the body, all the fur is standing up, the shoes, the desperation and the severity, that become the different narrative. So compared to this image, I did not use two lenses. This use one lens because this two image is taken apart in a matter of two, three seconds. But if you use a 600 millimeter lens, you do not have the freedom to render what your creative point of view is. So you, you want to show this image first, lying is the main subject, and then the second one, the mongoose is the main subject. Just by turning the focal lens, you will have different narrative. You become a two almost complete different images. So that's what I, the third time I emphasize this. If you only bring long lens at 600 f4 or 800 f5.8 lens to Africa, you don't likely get very good action shot like this and uh, for a creative photographer or who is action oriented or, or drama oriented photographers zoom has provided the best tool to give you the freedom to create the shot you always visualize same story here very close, instead of use 70 to 100, I use uh, zoom lens at a 400 millimeter. Actually, because for me, this shot, the um, the main story is the is the, uh, the, the the baby gazelle. It's painful, it's disturbing. I know it's uh, sad, but it's a story of the nature. Um, later on in Q and A, I probably gonna um, talk about the uh, how the photographic competition judges the judging the uh, image. One of the elements is called emotional impact. Emotional impact can be pleasant, like a baby playing with the mother, or can be um, not that pleasant. For instance, this image, you feel the sadness, but nevertheless. A sadness and a pleasant, they both is kind of emotional impact. Same thing here. And also the zoom lens also give you a creative tool anytime, even um, for a poetry show, you can just zoom in the, the how to say it, just zoom into the 
uh, interest part you want to show. Uh, so I, I emphasize here, especially for the creative um, um, thinking of the wildlife photography, zoom lens is the best tool. I think the uh, the um, um, I think the uh, um, another photographer. Um, if uh, now people following my Facebook page and also the uh, my YouTube, is recently I did a interview with myself and Austin. I think the one of the most influential wildlife photographer of our time. And um, I think it's it's the same way of thinking because he is a very creative uh, photographer and his major camera, uh, major lens when he used in, in um, Masamara is also 180 to 400 millimeter at four lens. And also the, uh, not just the long lens, um, very often people ask, ask me, um, uh, Jeff, if you go to Africa, you go to Masamara, how many camera body and the lens you use? I said, I usually bring two camera bodies hook up with three lens. All these three lens are zoom lens. For instance, this image was photographed using the 14 to 24 millimeter F2A. And, um, and also 70 to 200 millimeter, you get very close, um, like landscape in the morning, landscape shot. And of course the uh, 140 to 400 uh, millimeter lens for the action shot. So this is a 14, 24 wide angle lens, the usage, especially in the season like this, the rain season, in the afternoon when the storm start to build, you will have this very, very dramatic sky, which your 14 millimeter lens will enhance the mood and the directionality of the cloud in the uh, sky. And also the, of course, as if you want to have some very good shots, you have to know your subject well. You have to um, do lots of works. For instance, um, the uh, the um, cheetah mother hunted a gazelle, so the hunting was very exciting. So everybody photographed the hunting, and then when they start feeding, the cubs coming, they photograph the mother and feeding. And after 45 minutes, they left. But I will stay as close to this scene as possible, just, and I pre-visualize pre where the mother gonna lick the baby and uh, um, to find the best angle, just wait there for 45 minutes, one hour after food, when the cup, the cup's face covered with blood, the mother will clean the cup. You will get very good intimate uh, caring uh, interaction shot like this, because you know this is happening. So if you can predict this happening, it's easy for you to plan in the shot like this from the very beginning. So get to know your subject and predict the, uh, and also this one too. That's the, uh, um, uh, uh, one of the prior we've been following in the double cross area on Kwai Lai. That shot was two years ago when the, uh, every morning when this whole pride of young lioness and the lion, this basically actually are two very young male lion playing in the morning. And uh, we know every morning they, when they come out, they will play along the way. So basically, and you know how they're gonna play is one will attack from the other, another one will turn to fight. So you predict this action happen, you will follow them on the side, a little bit ahead, just to following them to predict them. And this one, I actually uh, know there are so many lines. They are, at that time they have about nine, seven lines. Because I know this happened, we're gonna have another line in the frame. So instead of use regularly use f5.6 um, uh, depth uh, aperture, I use f16 just to get the third line. Actually, it's still a little bit of the uh, out of the focus, but you can see with f16 the depth of field. The third line you actually can see very clearly of his facial expression that he's not very happy to seeing two of his brother fighting. 
So, but if you did not predict this will happen, you probably very likely use f5.6 or f4 after the third line become a yellow blur dot. But with predicting this uh, happening, you use f16, you can get these the third line into the narrative of the of the story. Same to predict um, the um, where the, the 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 hunting, chasing, running route, and to get the shot like this. Um, it takes years of experience. I mean, eight years. I always working with the same group of the the driver, uh, which I've been working for past. A year at the beginning when we start to photograph Chita Han, try to photograph Chita Han on 2013, 2014, most of our shots are bad. We hardly can get something like this because uh, we don't know the subject well. But after so many years, uh, we've been photographing more than 300 Chita Han. So right now we are very, I mean, all to predict where the kill zone is, where in which part, of what kind of shot we can get. We have very accurate predictions. So they take time and a practice and we learn together with my drivers um, to, 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 right now it's quite easier for us to get something like that. The last one uh, I will be talking about is the, is the uh, um, post-processing. So post-processing is a very complicated issues. Um, there are so many uh, software, so many uh, projects, so many filters you can use to um, doing post-processing. And even different uh, trade of professional photographers, for instance, commercial photographers, landscape photographers, wildlife photographers, sports photographers, uh, photojournalism, uh, photojournalists. We all, because our task and the requirement are different, so we use different photographic software. However, as a nature photographer or wildlife photographer, I think regardless of the what kind of uh, software you're using, there are principles, what I call P4, principles of professional post-processing. The purpose of this, uh, especially for, I, I'm just talking about the nature and all, all specifically wildlife photographer, okay? The purpose of the post-processing of professional nature photography is not creation. So you do not create it something out of nothing. It is an enhancing tool to help photographer to realize the vision when they take the photograph. So to be detailed, as, as I said, regardless what kind of software or filter you are using, there are, for me, there are four things, um, the four principles you can, you have to always abide. And this also actually coming from the, um, the foot, many photographic competition I have been judged is a prerequisite or the, the um, parameter of the, the post-processing. So number one, I think the title is always, is, you do adjust, but not manipulate. So what is that we can discuss in this four point is, do not adding or subtracting the contents of an image. You can, you can crop out some part, but the image which you're showing the viewer, every element in that image, must be able to be found in the raw image. You can changing the the uh, saturation of the color. You can change the um, the contrast or the brightness of the image, but you do not add or subtracting the contents of the image. You never put a fish into the bird's mouth. Okay or combine two a prey or a predator into the same image. Okay, so this is the bottom line. You never cross that. As a nature photographer, especially when you join the photographic competition in nature part, um, 
I have I I I don't know how many occasions we have been disqualified. Uh, uh, looks excellent image, but being disqualified because when we ask the maker to show in the raw image, they do not have the raw image, or they have the raw image which obviously is being altered. Okay, so that's the bottom line. Number two is. Do not change the physical characteristic of image pixel. What that means is very commonly what we see is blur. So you have a cheetah running, you have some destruction at the background, like a tree of uh, uh, tree branches or the rock stumps. So you can do a partial adjustment by reducing their contrast to reduce the visual impact of the image, but you cannot blur that background, especially in nature competition. So actually to identify this kind of, uh, it's very simple is, you, if you see the image and the background is blurred very perfectly, sometimes too perfect uh, as, a, as the, uh, um, uh, as the uh, judge, especially when we were uh, online judging, I will just simply to zoom in the edge of the main subject and the blur background to see the consistency of the image pixel. Um, I mean, I, I should, I think I can, in later on in Q&A, I can find an image you can see, zoom in to 200%, you right away you see this image pixel being blurred. So that's what I mean. It's actually, it's like, like changing the content of the image. Number three is partial adjustment with a clear intention. If you do any adjustment, if you just do a contrast, if you do a brightness, um, sometimes you do globally or just part of, for instance, you just want to brighten the eyes of the lion or a cheetah, you do a partial adjustment. But no matter what kind of adjustment you do, you have to know why you want to do this because I want to enhance this part to make my viewer, to draw my viewer's eye right away. Like this, you have to do any adjustment with a clear intention. In D, the first part, enhance the color naturally because in the competition, when we're judging the competition and also online, they are just way, way too many image. Uh, oversaturated, uh, it just does not look natural. You get a purple grass, you get the uh, the, the blue-eyed line like that. It's it just, it just not, I mean, that, I mean, when you are not sure, you'd rather not to do it, okay? If you want to enhance the color, yeah, you must know what you are doing. And also, please calibrate your, your computer, your, your, your screen. I mean, I know some of the photographers, they did not do uh, a good job on color because sometimes very often you see the color casting of blue or, or yellow color because the uh, screen is not properly calibrated. So do not, the last one, do not change the logic of the light. What is do not change the logic of the light? I think the very bad example is overusing of the HDR effect. Uh, because you know our, our, our eyes are, are building to detect the brightness and the shadow, and brightness and shadow gives the depth of the subject. It creates a three D three D sense in your brain for this this uh, um, for, for the for the uh, texture of this subject because the light part and the shadow part because, but right reason few years, we have been so seeing so many overuse of HDR, which you can see the shadow part has the same brightness as the the part where the light directed hit. So it just do not, it looks just very messy. So um, that's a very common problem. Uh, lots of people when they're doing the uh, post-processing, the, the mistake they often to make, maintain the logic of the light, give the, 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 the texture of the sense of the depth to the subject. So um, 
right now my uh, lecture is, has been two hours. I think we can uh, come back. Okay. <coughs> uh, I don't know about you guys. So I need to, uh, I need to, uh, um, how to say it? I need to uh, go to the washroom for two minutes. Can we re consume yeah, yeah. Uh, in two minutes and then we do Q and A? Okay, sure. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah. So that was a spectacular journey. You know, each and every image was awesome, and each and every story was amazing. And uh, thank you. So yeah, you can uh, you yeah. can just yeah. go ahead. Right now it's two o five. No, sorry. Right now it's uh, a it's a o nine. Maybe we come back at a five minutes without being right. late. Sure, yeah, sure, not just sure. for me, for everybody else. Because yeah, this sure. is a very long uh, talk. I know I have <laughs> yeah. a problem. When I start to talking, I cannot just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See All you. right. See you. Yeah. So that was uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey Wu. Uh, I mean, especially when it comes to hunt, you know, there is nothing like uh, nobody. I, I haven't seen any other photographer. I mean, I've seen hunting images. But this consistency in hunting images, I haven't seen in any other photographers. I'm sure there will be thousands of other photographers whom we don't know personally. But then this man is spectacular. It's not just cheetah. It's cheetah, it's lions, it's uh, leopards, and anything and everything. If there is a hunting sequence, if Jeffrey is in Mara, if Jeffrey is in that area, he missing it is very unusual. <laughs> so it's uh, that happens by uh, practice. Yes, three hundred yeah. cheetah hunts, man. Imagine somebody <laughs> seeing three hundred cheetah hunts. That is, that is the dedication. You know, that if, uh, if you know, we all have different uh, likes and dislikes, but then. Seeing 300 cheetah hunts itself in your life, in, and, in and front that's, of your that's, eyes. That's a big part of uh, patience you have to have. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, when I'm in Mara, I I never look for hunts. <laughs> Absolutely, no. I mean, I'm first yeah. of all not a big hunt fan at all. Um, if it happens or if only some guest requests for it, yes, we go for it. And the major problem, even when we are, even when our guests are requesting for it, you know, if we are take, talking about this five cheetahs, we know that in every three days they hunt. In yeah. most likely, in every three days, more, uh, sometimes if the prey is small, then every two days. Uh, and this time, this time around, we have seen cheetah chasing and attempting for almost three consequence day. You know, continuously we have seen it. Yeah. So your dedication play a major, major role, whether it is exactly. action or um, uh, you, you want to capture action, you want to see hunt. Yes, focus on it. That is the only way to become a master in in anything, uh, be it, yeah. uh, whether it is action or whether it is hunt or whether it is love or wild tender moments or whether it is playing with light or backlit image or rimlet image, anything you're going to focus, I'm sure you will be able to make a mark in your life. So exactly. uh, there is no shortcut over here. Uh, there is no overnight, uh, uh, what do you call, overnight fame in this. Certain images may help you to get into an overnight. If you want to be in that limelight for a longer time, your content should have that kind of consistency in the quality of your content. So that is also important. So it's not the one night magic, the duration or the life is going to be shorter span. If you want to keep up that spirit, you need to do a lot of work in that journey. And, and Jeffrey is a great example for that. Yes. Uh, I think he's back. Let us welcome him again once again. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
So we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Lehermi, I think it's better if you can get in charge of this <laughs> one day. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Just let me show the uh, screen. I find some sample images. But anyway, okay. um, let me share the screen. Yeah, I have this. No problem. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I can yeah. share anytime. Yeah, so uh, more like majority of our audience are uh, aspiring photographers, the 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 people who are learning the basics. So we are getting a lot of uh, basic questions like, what are the uh, settings for an action photography? The the key settings in yeah. Okay, um, I think uh, for the hunting shot, um, the uh, for the all the action shots, um, I. I use I use um, very consistently. Um, I use the uh, uh, very simple shot. Just, just let me elaborate the shots. So, professional photographers like me, uh, we don't make our camera setting very complicated. Yeah. I always use one kind of only one kind of exposure mode. One kind of focusing mode to photograph okay so uh, i think the uh, uh, for the uh, entry level or uh, even many of advanced uh, even some of the professional photographers i think nisha had a very uh, good point is if you hang in here long enough you will get some very good shots but the consistency of maintaining the good a uh, high quality image or what we call the always like i mean i love photographing mara <laughs> sometimes yeah. i i think that that that, that, that maybe a little bit of, uh people will think arrogant but it's not arrogant i love to photographing in mara in high season you know why because of one hunting shot you have uh, 15 cars there waiting at the end of the the hunting. Yeah. So there are 15 photographers, many of them also led by professional photographers. And at the night, so the cheetah hunt at the night, they get the shot. Everybody got the shot, the hunt. But if you un analyze that that those images by different group of photographers, my always have the best one. I, I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, this group of uh, images. Sorry, it take me a little time. I have too many. No problem. No worries. Oh, okay. okay. I just give you a very good example. This yeah. image was shot in this year, January 14, in Masamara. Uh, you have remote the share option. I know. I, I have to find oh. this image. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we go back to the sharing screen. Sorry. It's a very good example. And very typical, they happened in, the, uh, in Mara. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. This is the uh, Imani um, uh, hunting the uh, uh, Thompson Gazelle. So I don't want to mention the other photographers because um, I really, I mean, it's kind of, I may get in, into trouble because another photographer is also <laughs> <laughs> we have 12 cars there. So first, um, me and my driver, we predict the, this attacking route of this cheetah and also how this thing going to go down. So we use, see from very far, um, this cheetah, I mean, of this start running and uh, mm -hmm. they just uh, come to uh, hunt this uh, impala in front of us from 120 meters to 80 meters. Okay. 
You see the con con the the whole series of this hunt. Uh, of I think the the full screen is not working again. Okay. Uh, so you can connect with the entire screen option. Yes, sorry, I remembered. Okay, share. Share. Let me stop screen and then share screen again. Yeah. Yeah. To the entire screen. Okay. Yes. And then hi. Did you see the my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Is this right now full screen? This yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let, let, let me show you. This is the first shot. Okay. okay. Of course, the whole series about thirty-seven shots. I just choose the best. I just choose the best one. You see the whole series. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And not just that. I show you a video. Okay. Let's show a video. Sorry, my computer Sorry. desktop is a mess. Um, <laughs> I shoot. The, I shot the video at the same time. Nisha was there. He knows that I always hook up. <laughs> if yeah. you see this image, you see I always hook up my camera with a video cam. In this case, I was using. Uh, this video I was using the uh, the uh, but, but we can explain this a little later. I can show you a video of how that works. Yeah. But I was shooting the video at the same time. So let me see. <clears throat> Sorry, D. To see which one I have just too many. <laughs> when you have seen three hundred hunt sequences, it's quite natural you will have too many. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay. Can you see the the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. That's the shot I, sh I captured with. Uh oh. Okay, you search all the Facebook posts for the uh, in Mara for the uh, Imani hunting from January 14th that day and after you 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 will see the other photographers, they captured when the cheetah get the gazelle, but not the whole chasing and focus. So it looks like easier for me now, but that actually requires camera setting and the practice of three things. Number one, my set, because at that two, three seconds, you don't have time to change anything besides you zoom in, you just, just turn the zoom so because you zoom in from far to the end. You only have can do one zoom in at the same time. You have to maintain the focus and uh, and uh, um, and uh, keep shooting. So for photographers, we don't make our camera setting very complicated because we don't have time to change. We have yeah. one thing fits all kind of setting. So my setting here for the record, I use a menu. Exposure mode. Exposure mode. I use manual okay. because I can always control the depth of the field. Because the two image, the, the first two image you see, the cheetah and the gazelle and, and the impala, they both sharp because that afternoon we photographed this at three o'clock with the front lighting. The light is sufficient. I was using the the uh, aperture at f sixteen. Many people will using f5.6. I use f16 when the light is enough. Of course, sometimes it's too dark. You can only f5.6. I feel that's not a story. But when cheetah hunting in the daytime, I always use f16 or f11. 
okay. to give the maximum depth of field. Otherwise, you get the cheetah in focus, the impala is not in focus. That's number one. Shutter okay. speed, two thousand of second. Okay. Two thousand of second. Um, the ISO, because exposure value is combined with aperture shutter speed ISO, I always set my ISO in auto. There are very many photographers, I, I, I mean, I, I can understand where this comes from. They never shot something ISO more than 3200 or 6400. Okay? Yeah. Many of them, I mean, there are so many of them. You, I, 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 I just even almost about 70, 80 percent of the photographer I've encountered. So in this thing, if they want to maintain the eyes lower than the 6400, they have to use f4. Yes. You, you have to use f4 at 16 hundredths of second. Yeah. So what happened is the first three image of the Impala and the cheetah all in focus. You won't get that. You only get one in focus. Okay. okay? That's number one. Um, but why people do not want to shoot the 6400 and the 3200 and up? Because when the digital camera just started to produce, especially from 2009, Canon 5D Mark III, the 7D Nikon was D3, like that. Yeah. I do maximum 6400. And that time, the, the noise of the sensor is so so bad and then at that time back that time the software for the denoise software is not as advanced as now so they know even you shoot an iso more than 6400 the image is not usable anyway so yeah. they gave the problem is these photographers they started become famous at that time so they start teaching the student or the leader tours until the rest of the followers no you never shoot 6400 and up yeah okay that's another problem of digital era is the technology are so fast advanced right now for instance the um Denoise AI of Topaz, the uh, artificial intelligence software, Denoise. I, in the height photography, we constantly shooting ISO twenty five thousand to fifty one thousand two hundred. No what? problem. Now. <laughs> yes, you do height photography in Anturi, Next time you in Mara, yeah. I take you to Anturi to shoot as this night photography, height photography. You are constantly shooting ISO at twenty thousand and up. So, but if but right now it's 2021. But if you're still using the concept of 2013, 2014, 2015, that you never shoot 6400 up. Why? These manufacturers they push the ISO into 51,000, even 100,000. So, so what is a professional image? For me, an image after you publish, after you share in website. A publisher or the magazine will come to us. He said, uh, "We want to publish. Can you give me high definition image?" So I gave him a high definition, noise free, very professional process of the image. Okay, even that image was shot at ISO twelve thousand eight hundred or twenty five thousand six hundred. For instance, at the Cheetah Hang, you see that's a one where shooting uh, of the that was very dark in the in the. Uh, in, in the in the in the forest, the um, Imani hunting the. I can I can just show you, because yeah. right now you are seeing the full screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So let me just show you this image. I, I show you this image was published in Times, uh, newspaper. Uh, oh, we just use this. We just use this. Uh, how to say it? Yes. Yeah, go this way. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this one. This image. This yeah. image shot at the ISO 18,000. What? Yeah, in I the afternoon. Afternoon, in the, okay. 
in the afternoon. It's almost sunset. And also, it's almost sunset, and also the uh, it was very dark because it's in the forest. But I have no problem to publish this one and also sell it um, in, <laughs> in the, because uh, so that is something I see is not right. Is and what was uh, the camera you used for that? What I was what using one DX one DX Mark II. Oh, okay, and oh. you used no 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 not one DX. Sorry, sorry, that's twenty ninety. DA um, DA fifty, DA fifty. The maximum ISO is twenty five thousand six hundred. But what, what about I want to point out is the the image last year alone. There are forty billion image on the internet. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> but. So most of the image are mediocre or average or, or very bad images yeah. because of the digital era or teaching of the digital photography, not as advanced as fast as our equipment and the software. Two reasons. Number one, some photographers, I mean, it's a sad, I, I've just seen some photographers. Some photographers on 2013, 2014, when I just started photography in Africa, I look up to them. They are my model. I want to surpass them. I want to choose something better than them. And I did. But what happened to them is until right now, their best portfolio images still the images from 2013, 2014. Mm. So in general, their concept is not advanced through the years. It's just repeating themselves year after year. That's number one. Number two is for these seven years, they do 10 tours per year. Every tour have seven photographers, 70 photographers per year. So, so many years, they taught, for five years, they taught 350 photographers doing the same thing like them, <laughs> including use 600 F4 lens, not the zoom. <laughs> yeah. Number three is, number three is, Many of the photographers, especially photographers come to Africa. If you see the photographer in Africa shooting wildlife, you see the average age is age 55 and over. Many of them have money because after they retired, they have money or they have time to travel. So the problem with this generation is I'm 53 years old now. I was born in 1966, 65 years old actually. I lost track. <laughs> but but they cannot learn enough processing skill. So by that, they refuse to, to, to try to learn or accept more advantage of the digital post-processing. Yeah. So what happens is they have to maintain the low ISO to keep the image quality. That's another reason. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, but but now, but you can keep doing this year after year. But you see now the new generation of the photographers, what they are doing and what they are using the setting are always. I mean, ISO wise is always like that. It's, for instance, if you go to laboratory height for the height photography, if you don't use ISO, if you cannot handle the shell, you don't know the the work process of the ISO ten thousand up. You basically cannot get the shot. Okay. You cannot get the image like that. So that's why you see right now. Um, last time I was leading uh, for Canadian and uh, Kenya local photographers because um, uh, one of them is my friend Paris Chandalia, uh, Nikon re uh, the Canon representative in Kenya, and uh, for me to have more in teaching to teaching more young and emerging photographers to break this old taboo that we cannot do this, we cannot do that. Try to understand why the modern camera have such a very good technology advantage in terms of hardware, like gears of the camera and the lens, and also the software yeah. to help you advance with the time. I mean, this has happened for the, for, the, uh, for instance, Myself and Austin, the, as I said, the one of the most influential photographer of the whole world, and also like Thomas Vigian, um, including the uh, what they call the uh, Benza Mate, the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. All those really master level photographers, 
they always try to push the limit, push the envelope of the equipment. And also, whatever the new software come out, we are always the first group people I want to try this. Like Topaz, I usually use Nick software Define 2.0 to do the post-processing. But Topaz started, oh, I pay attention last until I think uh, 2019 when they start, end of 2019 start the AI version. Yeah. I know this is the way, so right away I use it. Um, by, 28, uh, by 2020 in March, I already basically right now all my post process using the, the AI software, the Topaz Denoise. Of course, they, they cannot solve every problem, but main problem they have solved. So you can push 20,000 to, to 20,000, 50,000 at the night for half as long as you have enough, uh, enough, how to say it, enough um, details, uh, not details, the exposure. And also, that's another way of exposure is my camera, I tell you my camera sitting the exposure mode in M, I, so I manually control the aperture and, uh, and the shutter speed. I so just let it run as high as it can, I just let it to the, they can go as high as, as I don't care about ISO. But in exposure composition, I always set up on overexpose, at least one third of the stop. Of course, when you're shooting the uh, the uh, aerial photography to acquire the effect of the black and the lake surface, you have to underexpose two stop. But in Mara, every time when I photograph my camera, constantly shooting, in overexposed at least 1.3. But many sceneries you will overexpose. For instance, a bird start taking out, a bird on the tree branch, right? We, we all have this bird perching on the tree branch. We aim at exposure is perfect. He start taking off into the sky. And then you follow it into the sky right away, that bird will be underexposed. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah because, because the metering system of the camera, the metering, the sky, oh, they thought they do not they do not know that you want this bird be correctly exposed. Mm. They thought the sky is all exposed. So what happened is they press down the exposure. So the bird will like so for me, constantly when the bird starts taking off, I will think of taking off. I probably take a few like he's perching, but when he's about to take off right away, well, I will always expose 1.3 to two stars depend on the direction of the light because when you fly into the air, I don't care about even the sky is always exposed. I just want every detail of the bird on there. So this is a, this actually is a technique called ETTR, exposure to the right. You can just Google it, ETTR. Was invented in 2009 by a Canadian photographer. His name, name is Michael Rickman. He's a very good friend of mine. Okay. Very unfortunately, he passed away in 2016. He passed away at the age of 70. He started this. So basically, if, if I tell you, you have this uh, line, even the ISO is not very high, but you shot in the middle of the day, you have very dark shadow because the light contrast at the midday, especially you photograph line like very light color, the shadow is very dark, even the eye is only 400. So what happens is when you're in post-processing, when you turn on the shadow, you will receive tremendous amount of noise in the shadow, yeah. right? Yes. yes. But if you, if you control right, you always post 0 0.3 or 0 0.7 stop, which is a white, the highlight part of the line, still maintain all the detail, but all the shadow is lighted up already. So we do post processing, we always know when you raise up the brightness in the shadow, you bring up the uh, the, 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 the noise. Yeah. But when you overexpose the noise, and then in post process, you bring down back to darker, yeah. the noise actually reduced. Okay. So you, can, you can do some research. So this is uh, many of the photographers, they are using this technique, technologies. But still, many of the what we call traditional, traditional photographers, they still said you have to underexpose. <laughs> okay, especially Nikon users. I'm a Nikon user now. I mean, I I I, I contract with Nikon, so um, 
even in the Nikon, many of the Nikon users, they will be underexposed. I have seen at least three uh, Nikon, um, Nikon ambassadors was underexposed to get very, <laughs> not that good results. So, I mean, but anyway, that's everybody's choice. But what I still, what I'm saying is the technology and the gear advanced. We, if you want to be very good at this, you have to know your gear, know the, the most advanced theory, technology, software, and how to use them. That's number one for exposure mode. So exposure mode, I use M, manually control aperture, shutter speed, and uh, and ISO let it automatically always overexpose a little bit. Number one. Number two is, number two is focus mode. When I use Canon, I use AI servo, 61 point AI servo. While I use Nikon, I use the 3D tracking. The 3D tracking, the 3D tracking, lots of people overlook it. And, uh, and many people, they don't know how to use it properly. But for instance, from very far, you have, um, you have a cheetah hunting from right, running to the left, like this, okay? So you use single point focus, you use 3D focus, you use group focus or partial focus, doesn't really matter. You all get in, in, in focus. Yeah. But the really hard one is, which is my favorite way to photograph cheetah is the front front, just like the video you see it. Yeah. But they from front, 120 meters, in three seconds, they are 40 meters. So in 80 meters, the distance between your camera and the subject is constantly changing. And at the same time, you have to maintain the shot, maintain the focus at the same time, shoot. Yeah. Shoot the image, 20 images. Yes. That's the reason, that's exactly the reason. As I just show you that cheetah hunt scenario in January this year, nobody else, beside all camera, because we have, I was leading, I actually was, I was guiding our clients. One of the female photographers, she has been with me, she learned 3D tracking, and she okay. get the whole series as well. But we are the only two person among the 12 vehicles, get that shot. Most of the people you can see, when they come out, they get the shot. Yeah. But one of them is not clear. Either Cheetah is blur, or the Impala is blur, because they are not using the right aperture. But you see their shot, it's all when the cheetah already hold the, the Impala down. And then they require the shot, the shot because they are not moving anymore. But the whole sequence of chasing of the tackle of the turn, they did not get why. Yeah. Because it's using 3D tracking. Okay. Okay. So 3D tracking also, 3D AI server, Canon AI server started first. 3D tracking from D4, Nikon use it. At the beginning, it's not as good as, as now, but right now, the Canon 1DX Mark III and the Nikon D6 3D tracking, Canon 1DX Mark III AI server is the best tracking um, method for the Cheetah shot. Because you have to remember, even sports photographer, they can use auto tracking to photograph 100 meter spring in the track and field. Yeah. But that is 100 meter, 10 seconds, right? That's world record. Yeah. Cheetah's speed is three times faster. Cheetah run 100 meter only need 2.2 seconds. So you even, you said, oh, this method is enough for me to track track and fields, 100 meter spring. Yeah. But shooting cheetah, it's, I always say shooting cheetah, from head-on position is an automated test for a tracking system of the camera and also the skill set of the pro wildlife photographer. Don't think I get this idea overnight. That's, a, that's <laughs> over years, 300 cheetah hung. That's my, that's my, but the good thing is, if you get, if you learn how to use 3D tracking and any cheetah hung, you can get it. Of course, you, you need to have a camera like, uh, at least you have a, a Nikon 750, uh, 700, I think, uh, Canon 7D Mark II and up. 
like mm -hmm. like of course one dx like one dx mark two this is no problem so that's why i said number one from the setting of the camera we, we talk about this for half an hour already because there are so many information inside yes from yes. setting of the camera i only use two things and i hardly any change them number one exposure mode m iso auto Exposure composition overexpose at least 0 0.3. Sometimes you expose more, you have to adjust. You have, that way you can control the aperture and the shutter speed. Number yeah. two is tracking mode, 3D tracking. And also, that's a very, very important point because we can talk about it and now for this. <laughs> if you're using 3D tracking, you have to disengage the focus function for the front button and only use the back button focus for the AF on button at the back of the camera. Yeah. So the, the front button only can can trigger the shutter. We'll yeah. never, never use to focus. You have to have to get used to this kind of uh, uh, practice first. This yeah. this is very, very important for 3D tracking. But I mean, the time we already talk about <laughs> 12 or 40 minutes. So uh, well, well, we, we can talk about this for another seminar. I mean, yeah. just to yeah. Maybe you talk about this. Okay, mm -hmm. but anyway, what I mean is that's that's the thing. The setting, number one, don't get it too complicated. Oh, this one we have to use the spot metering. Oh, that one I have to use the uh, 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 shutter priority. No, just one fits all. Even, for instance, you have uh, a cheetah standing there on the top of the, the mount, uh, of the uh, turbine mount. So you photograph it. You say, oh, can I reduce this shutter speed from 2,000 to um, to uh, 500, for instance, because he's not moving, right? So 500, when you choose the 500 and the 2,000, your ISO lower, right? In 2,000, you use ISO 12,800. At the 500, you use Don't do that because you will forget. What happened is you use the 500, you just aim at a cheetah and cheetah C, uh, 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 just uh, just uh, like a mangoose come up, she said, we'll right away jump, jump yeah. out of that and then grab that. What are you gonna do? First, you keep shooting and then you find out, shit, I'm shooting at 500. So it's all blurry. So why you just keep to 1,000 or 1,600 all the time? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay, he said, because it's on the mount, I only use 500 the ISO 400. So I use 2,000 ISO 6400, but when it's a hunt, you don't mind 6400, right? As long as the image was properly post process, properly uh, um, exposed and focused, this is a professional finisher. Nobody care about, nobody. people ask me how you shot that image. Nobody asks you, do you shot that image at 12,800? No, if I don't tell you, I don't even know. So why you care? Why you always keep at a two thousand of second? You can shoot actually at any time. Yeah, right. So that's a bad habit. So I always try to simplify the shot because I just want need to grab and shoot right away. And I have a three second method. I always, when I lead the tour, I always tell people is what is three second method is the best shot. Many of my best shot it happened. It, within three seconds when the vehicle stopped. It's a very, for instance, two kids are fighting, like a life and death kind of fighting, very severe. So you go there and you stop. So you take it out, oh, Gazelle cell, I just, I have to use F11 because um, that's too, you know, maybe not the same way. I have to use uh, 2000 and then I, I saw, and then you, they're gone. Yeah. So what happened is I always, when I see this two kids are fighting like a hell, from very far, I will tell all my group in my car, we don't approach first as everybody, make sure you're at the 2000 F11. Okay, so when the car is there, you just hold the camera. When the car stops, you just aim and shot. Because within three seconds, they're gonna, come, they're gonna be gone. Really, the car goes there, car stops, they're aiming, pa, 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 pa. 11 image, and then they'll stop. Look at the people, they run away. So so, so for, for, for the photographers, one left half is the efficiency to can increase the number of the good shot that you have, and you have to be ready anytime. Pull it out, just shoot it. So do not get so many complicated settings. Your camera is designed to be complicated 
very high function, but you only need to get enough of this function to satisfy your shop. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So that's the main point. That was an amazing point. <laughs> amazing. I mean, it, this is definitely like you sit in a class and learn. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I think uh, almost all the questions answer is there in that. Yeah, in, in one particular <laughs> one. That's so good. Well, the, the, I tell you, the, the thing is, see, and another another way, uh, another reason I tell you right now, the teaching for wildlife photography or for photography alone yeah. has not the, the, the teaching and upgrading for the technology and, and many of the pro photographers some photographers they know the trick they don't yeah. want to teach you yeah. especially people who use the photography as a livelihood like me like me because he said okay you come here you know which camp we stay you know where the how to get the information from cheetah next time i just come along i don't need you yeah. so he lost the business so but so he has to maintain advantage that you always he always have a better image than you are. So if he thought he teach you all the tricks, you are better than him. So that's what <laughs> he does not want to teach. But for me, it's different mindset uh, of mentality because for me, leading tours, I have to make the photographers happy. They are my clients. This is a service industry. When you're leading, you're teaching the service industry. So I tell you my photographer group, 80% of my photographer group, they come with me to Africa every year, three to five times. I mean, not in COVID, in the normal year. Yeah. They are retired high end because every time they come in, they learn more. They practice better. They get a better image. And every time when we shoot something, I let them shoot first because they, they said, oh, yeah, maybe you can. I said, no, no. Sometimes they forgot their camera or their camera broken. I just gave them my own D6. I don't shoot. You know why? Because I am here 10 months per year. <laughs> and what I already achieved, or what I already teach them achieved, yeah. they cannot be achieved. They cannot overtake me. Come on, man. You have to be 10 months per year here in Mara with me, thinking like me, shooting like me, have the same good camera gear like me, and know how to do it, know how to visualize it. To be good. So for me, I try to help them get as many good images as possible because from the mindset is if they come with me, I mean, I have a photographer come to Africa 10 times. They, they join the other photographer's group and they come in by themselves. But one tour with me for 12 days in Mara, they get 45 good images <laughs> than what the previous eight tours combined. So I can help them every time they get so many good images. You think they will off the hook? No. Every year they pay me three, four times to come here to follow me again and again and again. Because that's different mindset. Yeah. I don't worry about the people who will surpass me. Actually, right now, in terms of the photography, I already reached the hype. I mean, you if you go to Mara, how many people do not know Jeffrey Wu? Well, I think so, everybody knows. <laughs> Everyone knows whether you go to me, or not. To me, the next stage of my main focus is bring awareness to the wildlife protection and the conservation, and also promoting the tourism for the Kenya because they are really being hit very badly here. Uh, the, 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 um, the, this two years by COVID, so that's my main focus, and also teaching now. I'm good, I know already, and I, I don't need to prove myself, but what I want to do is I want to have more people as good as I am. So now all my all my students, I mean, I encourage them to go join the photographic competition. If you will see the recent photographic competition from the um, the aerial photography competition or other natural photography, you see any like like a, a aerial photography flamingo shot with the I, I bet you nine out of ten is my student, because I encourage them to do this because, because business wise, if they are happy, they will net never off the hook. Yeah. Okay. They always know they will learn something new. They will acquire something. They will capture some better images than last time. Every time it's like that. 
So and, and through the years we become very good friends of, of them as well. So that is different teaching mentality as well. So I I would say for the new photographers to learn the new the best one. And also the good thing about the photography is you just look at the guy's portfolio. Don't listen to him what he's saying. He say no, sixty four hundred ISO. They all garbage. You look at his picture. If his picture is good, you're listening to him. His picture is not good. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Learn the ad, take the advantage of technology and the gear develop. Okay. Any other question? Uh, yeah, we have a couple more questions. <laughs> if you have time. I have time. I can sit here for the whole night. We can do this <laughs> hour seminar if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so Black Rose Photography is asking: When you see other photographers' photos, for example, on uh, online, what do you look? What do you most look in for? Uh, look into it, like what catches you see, your attention? No, no, no. Hmm? Yeah, what catches your attention? What is that wow factor for you in others' photograph? What will you look for in? Okay, can we just have a one moment because my. Screen start to freeze here. I have to adjust the modem. Okay. Give me yeah, a yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Sorry, we were in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that was one of the best uh, session what we had when it comes Advice. to the technical. So good, man. It was exactly like you know you be in with his vehicle on a safari and you are in front of us. Uh, doing what he want, what he's guiding. That is amazing, and what he said is very true. How many, how many uh, guides share all this information, even if you are going to pay? So that definitely yeah. makes a lot of difference as a person. So yeah, there are so many things to try in the next expedition. <laughs> yes. That's okay. Can you see me now? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me now? I, I'm okay now. Yes, yes you're maybe. perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, Black Goose Photography. I know only if you go to my, uh, um, if you go to my, you know who the, the, this person is? He's a very good friend of mine. Okay. okay. He's one shot my portfolio image. The one with the giraffe. Oh, and ah, okay. The lens. He shot that image. That's my only trailer. Hi, Oli. <laughs> uh, good. Um, I, I I think that's a question which we I actually uh, bring out in the presentation. But I said that we're doing Q and A right now. Probably is good, very good uh, point to bring this out. Is yeah. how we evaluate an uh, image. So very often I see the people who is not very well trained photographer they are um they they always have the i mean i i used to chair uh i was admin in a photographic uh, website in online um what that was seven eight years ago i always have people in the forum they, they start to argue one guy posted the image said he, he saw the image were very good because his wife says so <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't believe in awesomeness, okay? So, but and another, so he posted that image. Another guy said, "No, no, no, that's a crappy image." And the two guys start to argue. So, and then people start standing the ground, one following him. But the problem is, when I looking at all the comments down, 20, 30 comments, nobody pinpoint out what the problem is. So, in general, how we evaluate uh, good wildlife photography images. Very simple. You just look at every photograph, photograph as a judge, like what I see as judge. So for the salon, as I said, there's two different kind of uh, uh, photographic competition. But basically, they have a very similar judging uh, uh, criteria. Number one, what we call uh, in salon competition, we call TOE facts. T is technique aspect what is technique aspect is is this focus sharp is this exposure correct is underexposed or overexposed the, the lack of the detail etc like that 
uh, when they do post process is the color right? Or does it have too many noises? The image quality is poor. That's the main five points a judge will looking at. Mm. Number two is O, T O E, TO, like uh, the O is organizational point. Organizational point is very simple. You basically, mainly 70% of organizational point is uh, composition. Did you make your viewer right away looking at where you want them to see? Okay, that actually have uh, two facts. And many people usually they do the they do the composition right, but they always ignore a very definitive fact of destruction. So they, they shot a cheetah hunt, but at the background, that's a very big branch just cross over or covered. This is the destruction. Okay. So to avoid this destruction, you have to, there's a two way. Number one, um, when you pre-visualize this shot, you try to choose the background kind of nicer or adjust the aperture. And also in post processing, as I said, you cannot blur the background but you can adjust the contrast or brightness to reduce the visual impact of that destructing part to the main uh, major uh, uh, main point of interest. So that is T and O. Yeah, T is technical part, exposure, um, the focus. O is organizational part. Three is basically is where draw the line for the because I experience judge usually they will have very good opinion, uh, very I mean similar opinion about technique part and organizational part. That's not hard. the problem. Is the third part? Third part is called emotional impact. T O E. What is the emotional e impact? Okay, just like a bird, a bird standing on the tree doing nothing, okay? So that's lack of emotional impact. As I said, even you shot in beautiful color, perfect background, uh, very clear detail in before 2014, October 2014, you may in photographic competition get a score of eight or nine. But right now, any kind of this kind of, regardless of bird or you are lying or you are cheetah, you score 6.5. You never win an award. So now, because so many in the digital, in the film era, 1990s, you get this one very, very easy to, to win a photograph company. Because not only people, but right now we have more than 20 trillion image on the yeah. internet. Mm -hmm. So you really want to stand out, you want to be something bigger. And then birds start to fly. So you capture the bird that fly shot. And then you get the bird and fly into the water and come out of water with the fish in the mouth. But you think that one, even in the competition, three years ago, the image I shot, the kingfisher come out of the uh, water with the fish in the beak. I will score him at a nine or 10. Right now, I only, even that image for, for right now the competition, I will just give him a score of eight. Take a look apart, three point. The organizational part three point, but emotional impact I only give him two point. You know why? Because I already seen a kingfisher come out of water with the fish in the mouth, with another kingfisher on top grabbing, <laughs> trying to grab. <laughs> so that, that's how 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 the technology affect us. This kind of image, fifteen years ago, you don't even dream of it. But right now, it's so easy. Camera does half the price. And, and 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 right before a kingfisher catch a fish, you probably online you get like every day you get like five six shots. Right now every day that's five thousand images like that. So you have to up your ante. You have to up your game to get. So for me, three things I'm looking at. Because if your technique part, for instance, your exposure, focus, image quality, noise reduction, all perfect. Composition, destruction, all very good. So the only thing draw beside you to the other people is the wall fact. What is the wall fact is, um, you see what I'm judging an international photograph competition, for instance, Nature's Best 
or if I judging the, for instance, 118, uh, 117 Toronto International uh, Salon of Photography, that was like uh, 20,000 image in four days. Every day you're judging 5,000 image. Most of the image, 99% of the image are mediocre average image. So you don't even want to analyze this exposure just because just a bird standing on the tree and then a bird standing on another tree, another tree, another bird standing on the tree. You just give a six. You don't even want to evaluate just six, six, six. That's how you can go through 5,000 images one day. But once a while, that's a world winning image come out. It's when they come in three judges, every judge before, six, next, Six, 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 next, six, six, seven, next, and all of a sudden, mm, next, every judge pause and look. That means the good image come out because he grip your attention. What I define a good image is this image, most of 99% of the image, I take a look when they play the next, I already forgot the first one, what it look like. But a good image is it will remind in your mind. Reminding your mind you, through the competition, you always, always remember, oh, that image was quite good. That image is quite good. Even after a few days, after the competition finished. And what is the 10 image? Because you give three point technical part, three point organizational part, and three point emotional impact part. You still score nine when you have a 10. 10 image is what I say. Shit. I hope that is my freaking image. <laughs> that's it. Those images you remember for years. Yeah. You in whole life. So that's the 10. So through my whole, I have been judging 50 in, uh, uh, photographic competitions, different level from club level, regional level, Ontario competition, CAPA, the Canadian national competition, international competition, etc. I only give a 10 twice. I only give oh, a 10 twice. You, yeah. I would definitely love to see those two images. To make uh, I can find one for you. I can find one for you, which is uh, Benson Matez in 2010. You remember that's an image of a tree branch. That's a poisonous snake okay. with a, with a, yes, with yes. a hummingbird face yeah. to face. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In the ring, you can see the ring job. That's a ten, and turns out after the competition, it turns out that is my friend. The but that time I don't even know him yet. Ben Samate, the Hungarian photographer. Yeah, the image I give a ten. Another ten, I forgot who took that. <laughs> but another one just, you know, another one is a is a is a is a is a competition. I think the photographer was from California. Is, uh, uh. It's a comrade, a comrade grabbing a fish. So the fish in the air, the comrade, the big open, try to swallow the fish. But the comrade and the fish was in the big opening mouth of a pelican. Can you imagine that shot? A pelican <laughs> opened the mouth. I think I the image. It's a, it's a comrade opened the mouth with a fish. <laughs> perfect background, perfect. Yeah. And, and the image I give a I said, you can't top that. Come on, man. <laughs> you, you can't top that. So that is what I'm looking for. Is is memorable to me. But however, the what I said, the judges always draw the line here is because I'm a very seasoned wildlife photographer. So to wow me, the image must be very, very good. But very often you have a photographic competition, you have to judging a wildlife photography uh, competition, you have uh, two wildlife photographer judging. Another one is a commercial photographer. She, she hardly did any wildlife. So for him, a cheetah, a cheetah standing on a termite, he thought that's a good one. He will give an eight. At the same time, another two judges will give six. So what happened is in a competition, when you have a three judge, you have a three judge, and they are scoring have a two point difference. You three, the, the people who give different score, you have to explain why. And usually that can be corrected. So that's what we 
evaluate as a professional judge, we, we evaluate the image. Of course, in professional level, there's rarity as well, because for instance, you have a snow leopard jumping over the cliff, try to grab the, uh, uh, that is so rare, right? Of course, I, I don't care another, your heron catch a fish, how good your image is. That snow leopard will win because of the rarity. So that's another level when professional photographer, when we compete, when we judging, that's another, we have to pay, take in consideration as well. And also sometimes we have to, as I said, sometimes we have the uh, biologist or animal behaviorist expert also in the judging panel. They may not know much about the, uh, about the uh, photographic, but they know, oh, this is the way where you photograph this animal you will cause damage or potential hazardous behavior to them. So that's different uh, level of game. But basically, when we're looking at, uh, at uh, wildlife photography, we always evaluate it from these three different perspectives. Number one, technique. Number two, organizational. Number three, emotional impact. Did you wow me? Did you make me yeah. remember? Yeah. Et cetera. Got it. Thank you. Thank no problem. So and also, and yeah. also for photographers, I always want to point out is is also when Nisha who brought out this point is consistency of high quality image. For instance, uh, since last year August first to now, I have uh, uh, stayed here for seven months. Right, I probably in the field, including Mara, Lantori, uh, Ambuseli, etc. I probably shoot uh, about 125 days active shooting. Do you know how many images I, I, I have captured? I show you. <laughs> this is the back of 10 hard drives. Oh my God. Every hard drive is a two terabyte SSD. That's 20 terabyte inside, all full. So, but how many images you, you see I, I was sharing from August <laughs> last year until now online, because even I almost share every day, I shared about 120 images, 120, 180 images, which is a lot actually considering for wildlife, the high quality images, 120, 180 images. But how many I shot? Three million. So you don't post everything if you want to really for the young photographers or emerging photographers. What I suggest you to you is if you really want to stand out from all of, if not those 100,000 photographers or 2 million photographers, you want to stand in all of them, you only post high quality images. Do not post everything. Do not post everything because when you always post this kind of image, so people think, oh, you are this level of photography. But you post a very good image today, next day you post an image with very obvious flaws. People think, oh, he's just lucky to get one like that. So that's a different perception. And for the young emerging photography, you really want to build your name to make people recognize your style, your work. You only post the good one, or you rather do not post. So that's another point I want to bring that's out. That's a valid point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more. Uh, please uh, share some information about how the night reflection portrait of the owl was captured from the hide in terms of camera settings and light. Sunil Dhar is asking. Uh, night photography or what? The uh, Please share some information about how the night reflection portrait of the owl was captured. Oh. Owl. owl. Oh. Yeah. The one in flight? No, no. with the reflection uh, in, in, in the hide. In the, oh, okay. Very simple. Let me bring out that image. Am I in full screen now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let me bring out hide. This image. See, this yeah. is the image he yeah. was referred to, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Very simple. They all fly into the water drinking. But if you see the, uh, you if you see the 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 number of this, I show this off at one fiftieth of second, five point point six at ISO twenty two thousand eight hundred. Okay. 22,800. Yes, 22,800. If we click another one, you can see it here. Same. This one is ISO 2800. Yeah. yeah. Same. Okay. The owl was the, the, the basically the uh, Lantori Hide, if anybody been there. Lantori Hide is a place with uh, is a water hole. We installed six uh, LED lights. Um, there, are, there are some, um, we can make it brighter. We can make it brighter. Actually, if I put like 20 LED lights, or if I use, instead of LED, I use the, uh, uh, I use a regular flood lights, uh, ampere flood light. Uh, we have a better, uh, lower ISO, but, but that will be harmful to the, uh, to the uh, um, to the animals. So to to us, uh, for us, the, the the camp owner Raji is very accommodating. When we build this high, basically we adjust all the lights. It's my first priority is to not harm the animal. Hmm. That's one of the reason we don't recommend. I, I myself, I never use a flashlight at night. Yep. Because for the terminals, I believe that's a, that's a debate, but I believe uh, that will harm the uh, nocturnal animals. So I never use a flashlight at night, but rather use this stationary LED lights. So animals have a choice. If they don't feel comfortable, they won't come in. Yeah. But if they come in, that means they can tolerate this light and you can shoot them. Yeah. So, but that require you have a very good camera gear you have a camera have to shoot like 20,000 and up iso and also you have to acquire some kind of a skill set of the post processing in order to to maintain the image quality okay okay yeah. so in that high if back to the story in that high iso auto usually you are shooting at uh, maximum amount of aperture, like f5.6, f4, even if I have f2a, use f2a camera, and the shutter speed anywhere from 1500 or 150 to 250. Some very, very rare case, I actually use a higher shutter speed, use f2a. Uh, let me show you one. Actually, it's another owl, but in flight, that's why I asked you. Okay. In flight, because 50, you don't shut in flight. This one. See this image here? Oh, this, yes. image, yeah. this image I shot at f3.2. Can, can you please enlarge it once again? OK, this image. Yes, yes. OK, it's all taking off from the water. I yes. shot at uh, f3.2. I should be in, in 2.2. Uh, it's a 7200 f2a lens 3.2 the shutter speed is 1 over 1250 uh, minus 3 stop because why I use minus 3 stop because the owl is in the middle of the pond is very close to the light very close to the light so when he's not flying uh, he's drinking he's very small but he's flying when his wing open all the white part exposed, they will be overexposed. So I did a three, four tries because he came like four or five times that night. So I, I finally minus three star. But see the ISO here, 45,600 yeah. ISO. And it was shot in D6. Uh, D6, yes. Oh. Sorry. Uh, so you, you have to have some very good gear <laughs> to, to yeah. do shots like this. About it. But th that means you, you know your camera limit and you try to push the envelope to, to make yeah. this work. Yeah. So uh, another question from Sayan Hirani. Uh, for wildlife photography, would you, would you advise using a, an advanced DSLR or a mirrorless camera? Mirrorless camera? Do you, adv do do you advise an advanced mirrorless camera or a DSLR? For video. 
No, no, for wildlife photography. For wildlife photography. To now, see, I I, I use both. I shot a video as well, and 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 I will give another five minutes lecture or ten minutes lecture a little later, just to show you why the video is the future of photography. Okay. I mean the black goose, the one who asked the first second yeah. question, black goose yeah. photography. He's one of the best videographer in Mara. Check out his uh, YouTube okay. channel. Okay, Oli, I, I did something good for you, man. Okay. So the the uh, the video when I doing video right now, I'm using mirrorless only. Um, that's the reason I I was giving the opportunity to become a Nikon ambassador. I refused. Uh, however, I I'm in contract with them to do the. Uh, commercial shot and also do the testing. I actually have a D6, uh, Nikon D6 uh, review uh, video I sent to them, I don't know, before Olympic, they probably gonna post it out. But anyway, but the reason I don't commit to Nikon is I'm using the mirrorless to shoot the video. And for the mirrorless shooting the video right now, the best it is Sony and Panasonic. Okay. Panasonic S1H, basically it's a cinematic, uh, um, this we don't need to talk about. The best video camera to me, I think right now is Sony E7 Mark IV. Okay? okay. So that's why I cannot eliminate using other brand. I use Panasonic and Sony as well. However, for the photographing, wildlife, still images, the 3D tracking or the cheetah hunt, you, you can shoot anything else, landscape, um, like uh, landscape photography or the uh, portrait photography or the uh, just like a photojournalism, you use the uh, mirrorless, no problem. But fast action, especially 3D tracking, like uh, like a cheetah hunt. And, and until now, even until now, we do not have a mirrorless can still compete with DSLR. Yeah. Period. Because the reason is mirrorless do not have optical part. So basically light through the lens hit on the sensor. All the focus module is a micro lens built around the sensor every pixel, right? So basically, no matter how, how good they are saying or blah, 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 there's still a contrast focus method. And the DSLR have an independent optical system going down, and they have a dedicated, like a D6 or 1DX Mark II, dedicated focus and a metering module. And they are not using, they are using the face detection comparison to do the focusing, not the contrast. Okay. And face contrast, comparison, you need the optical part to realize. I mean, in the future, as AI knowledge advanced, I would say within three to five years, at that time, the mirrorless artificial intelligence algorithm will fast enough to adjust as fast as we do use the DSRR. But right now, we are not there yet. So you can use mirrorless, but not your main camera. Especially if you're into action shot, you want to uh, shot a cheetah hunt, never use mirrorless shot. I mean, you can, if they run this way, no problem. But 3D head on, never use mirrorless. You will be so disappointed. <laughs> I, I have, people have, a, have some, uh, some, some experience in my group too. So, okay. no, no, I and, do the same. Uh, because I, another thing is my wife. Uh, she's a Canon photographer, and she's sponsored by Canon. So she is using R5 uh, to do the video, but but okay. because she is mainly doing the video now, but she actually she knows uh, she used the uh, R5 uh, with the best setting compared with 1DX Mark II with the uh, uh, for the Cheetah Hunt. She she actually did both. Still, even in her opinion, still mirrorless is not there yet. You still need at least three, five years. Oh, okay. But besides Cheetah Hound, they are pretty good. Yeah. 
Uh, what are your thoughts about lens calibration? Is it a must or a, or an optional? Uh, lens color, lens calibration. We are talking yeah. about camera lens, right? Yes, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I would, I would, I would advise every three four months, please do a lens calibration for DSLRs. Because you know why? I, I used to do that and at one time. That time, I think I was using uh, Canon 1DX Mark II. You know, the problem with Canon lens is the joint of the French by the camera body and the lens, the, the, the French, the hookup part, the, the metal is not as hard. It's kind of soft. Okay. So, so even you don't drop it, if you put in the car, in the Jeep, I mean, you guys are in Mara, we like bumping like for every day, four or five hours, and you do three months, that will have a problem. So I would advise every three months. For me, every time I, I, I do the lens calibration, go to Mara for two, three weeks after I come back, I do calibration again and then put it aside. Next time I just go out. So please do so. Okay. Especially some very detailed uh, uh, portrait shot. Yeah. yeah. Really, you, you really need to do it. Use it when you use the, the big aperture. Right. <laughs> and uh, we'll wind up with two more questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Subhi Sridharan is asking, uh, where can we find out uh, find about your tour details? Uh, he can't mm -hmm. see it in your website. Your tour uh, trip details, the workshop details, the the tours. Oh, you workshop do. Do. Okay, um, sorry for disappoint everybody. Uh, my main market is uh, high end Chinese professional photographers. Uh, we have, um, I mean, so that's why you don't see me po posting the um, tour information <coughs> on my Facebook. But if you have a WeChat, you know that. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, right now it's uh, COVID, so I have other assignment um, to cover it. But my tour is already sold out two years in advance. Uh, I do about 18, regularly about, do about 15 to 18 tours per year. Basically, I already sold out every tour until 2023. Okay. Awful. So, but still, because of COVID. So lots of tours start to cancel. And uh, for instance, I have a two, if you are in local in Kenya, you can always contact me while I'm here. For instance, um, I suppose I have a project here for the video. So I leave the time. And what happened is because my videographer cannot come from, from China to here. So we cancel that. And so I have a time slot. So, so two Kenya photographers, they, they are very good friend of mine. They grab this chat. Oh, okay, man, you have time? <laughs> Take us. So th that's how they can do it. But in general, I right now, I don't post any new um, tours for now. But in the future, every year, um, I have decided to take in 2023, I think 2023, starting from August, I probably going to post the tour on by end of this year by Facebook when we okay. see you know the travel situation because yeah. right now nobody knows it's just that makes busy. sense yeah. Yeah. yeah uh and the last question from uh maria uh, she's asking how much does these tours normally cost well if you do now for instance if you go to mara with me in a regular season i'm not taking talking about the uh COVID time a regular season if you go with me you are expecting for for instance i'm leading the tour about four to six people maximum and in general if they go to mara or amboseli like this uh, normal tour route anywhere from 800 dollars to 1000 dollars us per day that including everything including the uh, accommodation including uh, transportation including the uh, uh, including the uh, the driver because I only use my own driver um, and also besides my driver I also when you have a, a regular tour I will have another vehicle just do the spotting so when we're shooting the cheetah hunt that vehicle is looking for the lion or the cheetah with cub or anywhere but 
by the sunset, we can find the giraffe to shoot the sunset shot. And, and also, the uh, um, all my tours, usually, uh, when there's more than four people, we will, um, when there's six people, I will charter a plane. I, I don't do drive, because for me, if you drive from uh, Nairobi to Mara for six hours to the camp, back and forth 12 hours is one full day. So I rather yeah. use charter plane, could be there in 45 minutes. That's a regular tour. But if you want to do the aerial photography, that will be more expensive because the, the helicopter costs lots of money. It's about $1,200 per hour, anywhere from $1,000 to $1,200 per hour for, for helicopter. And that's only two people can share that uh, uh, place. So that's basically is a bone mark at regular season, what I'm, uh, my, my tour usually cost. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, today uh, we have to <laughs> leave you free. It's already three and a half hours. Yeah. Okay. So um, I just want to give another ten minutes. Sure. Yes. So I just talk talk about ten minutes. Actually, yeah. is what I want to really talk is about the uh, um, the uh, future of the uh, photography. What I try, from what I've seen is the future of photography is video, definite video. So I will encourage all the photographers, even when you are doing the still image, try to capture some video. The, okay. the, 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 there are three things um, to why I say the future is uh, video is from professional level, um, seven, eight years ago, I mean, I can sell my image very easily, fine art printing. At that time, I, I, every year I sold about uh, 50 to 100 of them easy. Now nobody buying them. Okay, but now more and more video sharing sites start approaching us to buying the video clip. The reason is number one, right now everything can shot 4K video from GoPro, from drone, from mirrorless, from DSLR, even from a phone. Yeah. From every phone have a 4K video functionality. Number two is 5G era is right by the door. Maybe in two years, maybe in three years. What 5G means? Means if I have a child here in Nairobi, his grandma's birthday, okay? So that child use the 4K phone to shoot 45 minutes 4K 4K high definition uh, uh, video, probably 1.3 gigabyte or two gigabyte. In 5G era, he can send that video to his aunt in Mombasa in two seconds. That's how fast 4G, 5G is. So at that time, at, at that time, 5 the video is is it will be in high demand. I still think of still image will be existing, but it will going down. So that's why right. every every camera maker right now, every phone maker, they put lots of research money in the video because that's the next wave. So in China, you see the highest growth internet company is TikTok, right? Yeah. TikTok, Douyin. In China, we call Douyin. They all videos, and uh, and so uh, and 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 also the video. The good thing about the video is. Uh, with other equipment with good editing you, you can make like lots of different short videos i mean i i just want to use the next five minutes i just show you two videos yeah the two videos is what i'm talking about there's two kind of videos number one is a cheetah hub so instead of you seeing 10 images you see the whole sequence of cheetah hub, this which is our group hub. another one is you 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 record your experience before you use a photo album right now you can just shot a short video yeah. with it and like a commercial style every frame is only three to five seconds but all together with you 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 mangled with the image in appropriate image it's just like commercial video i just want to show you two clip like this okay so let me see share sorry share. yeah it's already it's already there Okay. No, but it is video. So, like, actually, I do this video here.
Sorry, this is a little jog. Uh, just get you another one. Yeah. This is this this is actually is advertising for my for my tour. I think a full screen is not very good. Just, just play regular screen. Yeah. As we, as we enter the digital era, this is gonna be the uh, trend. What I want to show you these two particular one is um, now more and more um, photo tours, they actually offer this kind of like second commercial kind of like, they have a, a assistant using the uh, video cam to shoot your footage while you work in this tour. And then they cut into this one, of course, for a price. And also, you see the first one, the Tanobora hunting. Uh, of course, when we play it, it's kind of jacked. But yeah. that one was shot at 120 frame, uh, 4K. And okay. uh, um, we use the uh, Panasonic to shot that. You know, one of the, uh, uh, actually two of the, the, the video sharing website in China, they offer $50,000 for that clip, 15 seconds. So this is a uh, professional trend. This is already become a trend. And also that's another thing is, I know there are a couple of, uh, um, I think especially one of the National Geographic uh, project or what, they do have like, they have a documentary, but they don't have enough funding. What they do is they read this script, they subdivide this task to the photographers like me. He said, okay, yeah. I want this five white cheetah shot from this angle, 35 seconds for how much money. So what they do is they use like 20 photographer, videographer. They just have, instead of sending the whole team to Chile and then move to Masamara, they just pay one photographer in Chile, one, one photographer in Mara. They shot two different ones, they cut together. So this is a trend for the uh, professional wildlife photographers as well. So that's what I'm saying. The next wave in, I think in three to five years will, early as three years, as late as five years, it will be picking is the video. Okay. So short video will be future of photography. This has to, everybody has. So for the people who started in the safari or any activities, besides shooting a video, if you have more time, try to shoot 4K. Um, footage as many as possible in the future you all can use it in the video editing okay. so that's what i want to bring out the last point that's a great piece of advice again thank you <laughs>
No problem. And I have one question. So you use um, D6 or, uh, sorry, C6, C6 or C7 for videos? Uh, for the video, right now, I'm my own gear here, I use the uh, Z6, one Z6, one Z7. I can show it's in the, in the luggage. One Z7 and one Z6. I use uh, both. I have okay. a two hooked in the video. Uh, for the still image, I use D6 and D850 uh, okay. uh, with the three lens. That's uh, 180 to 400 and 70 to 100 and uh, 1424. Okay. So basically, so we uh, don't use a prime lens. I don't use what? Prime uh, lens. Uh, uh, prime uh, lens. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, very often I have uh, people who join me join my tour will ask me i said if you want to join my tour if you want to get image like this you you have to bring a prime lens a uh, zoom lens because okay. this is key for success it give you not just for cheetah hunt as i indicated zoom lens give you a fantastic tool to give you more freedom for creative shot just yeah. like a lot line you just zoom in all the uh, uh home view you just zoom into the head but also you can just zoom back to shoot the whole thing. If that's a yeah. two, if that's a two uh, a home view fighting over a frog, you want to shoot both. Yeah. But if um, frog is zooming, so that gives you so many freedom for this. So and also another point I have to um, point out is prime lens. Uh, the people, the reason people using prime lens for the bokeh, for the f4. Yeah. But you use F4, the bokeh is very smooth, right? Yes. And uh, that is very simple uh, adjustment. If you use like, a, I mean, about the same price, I think 180 to 400 is 12,000. Yeah. The 64 is also 12,000. So yeah. if you comparison to this, you can just do it because you can compare F, uh, 180 F4 with 1.4 teleconverter at 560. To compare with the uh, uh, 500f4 lens, not big difference anyway. So that is uh, and it's for the uh, pra practical use. It's uh, so many freedom. So that's what I'm saying is uh, zoom lens is king of the uh, the, uh, the uh, I mean it's for um, safari. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so how, much. I don't know how to say thank you. <laughs> it was such no, a we, we, can, we can actually hook up uh, another time. We can talk about something more detailed because there's, there's so many things I like to talk about is, for instance, the uh, well, the nature of photography, wildlife photography, social responsibility. Yes. Yeah. And the, ethic, and the ethic of photographing the wildlife. Yes. Yeah. And also the... Um, the learning, how, how, how really you can learn, because there's no course, no, no university teaching wildlife photography. Remember, every wildlife photography is self-taught. Yes. They have university teaching commercial photography, photojournalists, no school teaching wildlife photography. So every wildlife photographer is practically uh, self-taught how you learn and how you ace yourself, how you uh, how you come out, pop up out of hundreds of thousands of people come to Matemala every year. That's how you can be a successful wildlife photographer. Yeah. Yes. Etc. And uh, how you do the post processing, why you should use Photoshop, not Lightroom, uh, why, etc. etc. This, there's so many things we can talk about. But uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I'm going to Mara uh, tomorrow for 14 days shooting a documentary and also guiding um, two smart guys here. It just grabbed me for five days. So, and uh, we can talk about by end of May, yeah. when I have more time, we can schedule another show. It's, it's good yeah. to, 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 to talk to people who's willing to learn. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. And, and, and thank, thank you very much for re re inviting me. And uh, um, we, we, we are the old friend now. I mean, we. <laughs> it's we, an honor. Uh, it's really an yeah. honor. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And, and mostly, I'll be there in another a week or ten days time in Mara. So we'll definitely catch up. 
When? When you guys come back? I, I'm, I'm planning to. Be there. Hermes is going yeah, to. Be there. I'm planning to be there in uh, mid of May. Bye. Mid of the May. Okay. Yeah. Contact me, man. <laughs> sure, sure. May, I will be from, uh, I think, from um, until 20th. Tomorrow until 20th, I will be in Mara. Okay. For, he should for be the there week. before that. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky you, man. I'm going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so much. That's, that, that, that is my workshop, my, my talk. Usually my talk is three hours. My longest talk is six point half hours. <laughs> so I, I Maybe feel next the time. same thing. There is one fellow just mentioned that, uh, you know, not feeling good to say bye. I definitely don't feel like saying bye, but, you know, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. See you next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See you. Bye -bye. See you. Bye. 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 That was such an amazing session. Oh my <laughs> God, you get literally, I was almost in tears. It was that good session. You know, when you say teaching, this is what it's teaching. So it was pumping so, knowledge, pumping yeah, knowledge. From, from the beginning, from the first minute to the last minute for our longest session so far, three hours, yeah. 41 minutes. So every, it was every, such a every word, every sentence he says, something to learn from that. Yes. And let's let's pull him for another three sessions in coming yeah, months. Sure. <laughs> lot of okay. lot of people are uh, saying thanks to Postales. Yes, this is all what we uh, want to do. Like yes. maximum uh, re uh, reaching to maximum people, yes. sharing knowledge with maximum people, bringing in great photographers and conservationists so that they share their knowledge and we learn from them. Yeah. And at the end. Uh, reconnecting with nature, nature, coming closer to nature. That's all uh, what the sports race is about. Yes. Yeah. yeah yes, uh, Shiva. Uh, it's very rare that somebody really shares so much knowledge. That's yeah. it's it's the same thing that uh, like we have. We also have to say. Yeah. Whoever, luckily, whoever we brings in, uh, they 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 come with us. They share the knowledge very passionately. Everyone so far were very helpful. And we are looking for more photographers to join us in future. Yes. And anybody who can, who would like to do a session with us, who think, if you think you have something special to share with the audience, with us, then definitely please ping us. Please send us yeah. a message. We will definitely get in touch with you. Yes. And right now, before we say bye, we still have, we are still in the very tough situation of COVID and pandemic. You know, so please make sure you're staying safe. Please make sure you are using double or triple mask if possible. Please don't go out of your house if it is not that necessary. Please stay safe, social distancing, and try to do everything possible plus an extra step to make sure you as well as your loved ones and the rest of the world is safe. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. to everybody who participated and uh yeah good to know that it was helpful so see you next time we'll yeah. be back with another wonderful session soon uh, we'll update in our social media yeah thank, thank you. you bye 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 bye